choose not to follow the rules, the sergeant at arms will block your video and possibly remove you from the hearing. Thank you, Chair Rodriguez. We are ready to begin. Thank you, Sergeant. Thank you, Speaker Johnson, all my colleagues, and all New Yorkers. It, as everyone knows, we're going through a tough time. It, all our prayer to all New Yorkers, the 8.6 million, that we're going together through this uh, coronavirus situation, especially my prayer to Chief Murray, someone that I personally work so hard with him when he should be in charge of Northern Manhattan North it, it, and now with the Vision Zero and everyone that is dealing with critical condition. It, this hearing is so important because as package of bill led by Speaker Johnson and, and all our colleagues, we want to do whatever we have to do to support all our New Yorkers, especially those who live in the third community who need more help than anybody else. But also we need to be a strong and move on as a city. So I'm Council Member Danny Rodriguez, the Chairman of the Transportation Committee. Uh, first, I would like to recognize some of my colleagues who are here, Council Member Speaker Corey Johnson, Council Member uh, Ross Diaz, Cohen, Rivera, Holden, Minchaca, Levine, Ku, Cabrera, Yeager. And before I continue, I would like to turn it over to the speaker so that he will give his opening statement, whatever, and anything that he would like to address. Thank, uh, you, thank, you. thank you, Chair Rodriguez. Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope everyone is safe and healthy. It is actually so nice to see so many New Yorkers faces. It's the best part of my day doing these Zoom conferences to actually be able to stay connected to New Yorkers during this hard time. Before I give my opening statement, I want to take a moment, just like Chair Rodriguez just did, to recognize Chief William Morris of the NYPD, who is currently battling COVID-19. As the department's chief of transportation, his work on Vision Zero has saved lives and made New York a better place. And on behalf of the entire council, our hearts go out to his family and we keep him in our thoughts. I know him from working with him when he was at Manhattan South and he has been just a, a wonderful person uh, to interact with and to work with over the years. And I'm really devastated to hear um, the difficulty that he is having. And I'm really thinking of him and I have been the past few days. I also wanna thank the NYPD for being here today and for everything they've been doing to keep New York safe. They put their lives on the line every day for New Yorkers, no matter what we face as a city. And we have all felt the impacts of this crisis, but the sacrifices of the NYPD and the cost of the department has been particularly high. We have lost 31 members of the NYPD to COVID-19 related illnesses. Uh, over 4,500 members of the department have tested positive. Uh, nearly 2,900 are back at work and their dedication is a testament to the commitment of the NYPD to keep New Yorkers safe. I know that we are here <clears throat> under <clears throat> excuse me, under incredibly difficult circumstances. So I want to thank everyone from the administration, the NYPD and the Department of Transportation for joining us and for their work in keeping the city running. Today, we're here to discuss a bill that I am co-sponsoring with Council Member Carmina Rivera that would give New Yorkers more space on our streets. New Yorkers need to be able to get some exercise during these trying days to maintain their peace of mind and sanity. And we need space to social distance when we're out doing errands or going to work or bringing our children to the park. Every day that we have nice weather, open spaces are getting more and more crowded. May is right around the corner. I try to do, I have been doing a seven to 10 mile walk every single day uh, in the evenings. And I walk, I end up walking through uh, for small community parks uh, on the course of my walk and people are doing the best job they can to socially distance in those parks. 
but on the nice days when it's really warm and when it's nice outside, it's hard for people because so many folks come out to try to enjoy the weather, especially with playgrounds being closed, especially with pools potentially being closed over the summer and beaches being cut back. So we are gonna need to be able to create more space. I don't think it's gonna get better and we need to move quickly. Other cities have shown we can do this without overburdening the police with enforcement. I agree with the mayor that New York City is exceptional. We are the greatest city in the world, but we shouldn't use New York's exceptionalism as an excuse for settling. We should be trying to do more, to do better. It can't mean that we don't even try. New York is unique, but I will not accept that cities around the world like Oakland and Paris and Milan and Boston can overcome challenges that we can't. New York should be leading. And I don't think we should blame New Yorkers for government's failure to innovate. I don't buy the idea that our drivers can't adjust. I have more faith in New Yorkers. New Yorkers rise to the occasion. That's who we are. We've done it before and I know that we will do it again. And just to be clear, we are talking about a bill that opens up about 1% of our streets across New York City. Let me repeat that, 1% of our streets across New York City. I don't think that's too much to ask. So I wanna thank you, Chair Rodriguez, for holding this hearing. I wanna thank the advocates and the council members and the community boards that have been advocating for this. And I wanna thank New Yorkers for joining us today uh, virtually. It is so nice to see so many faces of people that I know and that I'm used to see I'm used to seeing at City Hall testifying. It's good that we can still be connected during this time and have this important hearing. So with that, Chair Rodriguez, I'm happy to turn it back over to you or to Council Member Rivera, who is the prime sponsor, and I look forward to today's hearing. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, let me say a few words before calling the prime sponsor, Hope Prime, together with you, Council Member Kalina Rivera. Uh, as everyone know, we are currently going through an unprecedented moment in the city history. And as you know, all of us should do every day, I would like to pay a moment of silence for all the frontline workers, our healthcare heroes, FDNY, NYPD, transit workers, delivery workers, and all essential workers. Personally, I can say to the great home attendants, I have seen living my own experience, having my mind not in your soul, the critical role that home attendants play to those women who take care of the elderly or the respect to them. So I first would like again to call for a moment of silence to those individuals who are the first responders. Thank you. Hoy nosotros comenzamos dando un momento de silencio a todas las personas que están trabajando, eh, doctores, enfermeras, policías, taxistas, todo lo que están haciendo trabajo esencial. Personalmente a las personas que cuidan, los home attendants, personalmente teniendo mi madre de 90 años, sabiendo que ella depende de la home attendants que la cuiden. Gracias por su servicio y le dedicamos recientemente un momento de silencio y vamos todos a seguir luchando para apoyar a todas las comunidades, especialmente donde están muriendo más personas, latinos, afroamericanos, asiáticos, los neoyorquinos más pobres. Gracias. Today, the Committee on Transportation Hall is first ever remote hearing to consider intro number 1933, a bill sponsored by a Speaker Johnson Council Member Cabrera, en Rivera, which I also a, a, have the honor to be a sponsor. That would amend the administrative code of the city of New York in relation to temporary space for pedestrians and cyclists. We as a city and as a nation are going through an unparalleled health crisis in our battle against COVID-19. Social distance, quarantine, and isolation have become the norm for all of us during the past months. And still, I gotta say that even though the number been going down, people dying, we need to look at different C code and looking at those people who are staying, is, is still in their apartment, that they've been told to stay there to deal by themselves with the coronavirus. So the coronavirus is not over. We are still are fighting this fight. And as we are addressing this bill, this bill is important. We also have to consider it, thinking about how 
and we had to again maintain isolation and calling to all New Yorkers on the same that we are still going still going through this battle. Our normally busy streets and roads have become desert. A shelter in place order have taken effect and we practice social distancing. Traffic in on our usually congested street has become virtually non-existent. However, so New Yorkers, like our healthcare professionals, emergency, policy responders, public transit workers, undocumented New Yorkers that they don't have the privilege to work from their house, that they had to make a decision between staying in their apartment or go, or, or go to work to make some money. They also need to continue walking our streets. And all of us still need to go out occasionally, occasionally to buy groceries, medicines, and other necessities or to get routine exercise, especially with our children. As we encourage and enforce social distance guidance, it has become apparent, apparent that we need to create additional space so that New Yorkers can walk and cycle safely throughout our city street during these difficult times. We have also seen a troubling increase in speeding drivers during this time. We must continue expanding protections for cyclists and pedestrians. We cannot burden our hospitals with preventable injuries or, or worse, death because the reckless drivers did not follow the law. And by the way, during this period of time, we also seen some hit and run happening in our street. We've been paying attention and, uh, and we know that the, N the NYPD are following those cases. Intro number 1933 will help us to, to do that by requiring that DOT to provide additional street space to pedestrians and cyclists in no fewer than 75 mile street while social distancing requirements are in place. Yes, imagine as I have said before, that we dedicate a lane of Broadway from Yonker to Battery Plaza. That can happen in our in borough, that can happen also in the five boroughs of the city of New York. These additional spaces would be created through the use of share a street or closing at least one lane on a street to vehicular traffic. This open street will help the city combat the spread of, the spread of COVID-19 and allow us to practice social distancing while outdoors. I now would like to Call on Council Member Kalina Rivera, Rivera co prime of this bill together with Speaker Corridor. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Chair Rodriguez, and to Speaker Johnson, and to everyone who is attending. Um, it really is nice to see people's faces. So good morning. I am Council Member Carlina Rivera, and I'd like to thank again Chair Rodriguez and members of the Committee on Transportation for letting me speak briefly at this hearing on my bill, Introduction 1933, which will temporarily require the city to open approximately 75 miles of city streets to pedestrians and cyclists during the COVID-19 pandemic in order to provide New Yorkers with more room for social distancing. I know this legislation has garnered quite a lot of attention for its simple but powerful methods of ensuring proper social distancing in our neighborhoods. And I'm excited today to explore and unpack how this kind of program can be implemented. But let's be clear, we cannot wait to pass this bill through the council. With congestion in New York significantly reduced by this pandemic, our Open Streets program presents us with the immediate opportunity to address the decades of inequities in zoning, infrastructure, and green space investments that have in part led to certain neighborhoods facing higher rates of COVID-19 than others. A neighborhood filled with mostly detached one and two family homes, backyards, parks, and people working from home doesn't need open streets the same way as a neighborhood where families pack into one bedroom apartments or children are forced to congregate on cramped and cracked blacktops. My bill would quickly redistribute space in these communities to allow for our essential workers to pursue safer commuting options provide outdoor opportunities for vulnerable New Yorkers, and give families a chance to play beyond the four walls of their home. At the same time, an effective open streets program must be one that is community-led from the beginning. 
Cities from Denver to Oakland have done just that with street locations, enforcement, and monitoring of their programs led by community groups instead of unneeded police officers. Each open street can also look very different. It could be as simple as movable barriers and a local traffic only sign at the end of a neighborhood block, a sidewalk extension with cones in the space where a bus would normally stop, or a temporary transformation of a major avenue into a linear park. And with this initial 75 mile stretch required to be built out in 30 days, we will be able to clearly assess and decide where and how we expand or change this program on the rest of the city's roughly 6,000 miles of streets. Now I know as a pedestrian, a bike rider and a park lover, how this program can be effective. But I'm fighting for this legislation first and foremost because as chair of the hospitals committee, I've had far too many calls with doctors infuriated and despondent at the images they've seen of parks crowded with New Yorkers or they're still struggling to save lives. Last week, expert epide epidemiologists, Britta Jewell and Nicholas Jewell presented research showing that if social distancing measures had been implemented on March 2nd, a mere two weeks before federal policies were put into effect on March 16th, an estimated 90% of COVID-19 related deaths could have been prevented nationwide. Implementation, even just one week earlier on March 9th, would have resulted in a 60% reduction in deaths. We may have begun to flatten the curve, but we must do everything for our heroic healthcare workers to ensure that curve doesn't trend upward once again. We hear a lot from city and state leaders about how imperative it is to practice social distancing, but we don't hear too much in terms of concrete plans to actually achieve this once we leave our homes. And as the weather gets warmer and warmer, the time for a real solution becomes that much more necessary. I hope this bill can be the start of a larger and successful solution for a healthier and safer New York. And I look forward to hopefully working with the de Blasio administration to achieve this effort. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Rivera. Uh, before calling right now on the administration, I would like to say that uh, we also would, would hear from the PWU, uh, especially on any ideas and suggestions that they can have related to being sure that as we will work on this bill, uh, the improvement of more space for cyclists and pedestrians also got along we continue improving the bus lane and bus services. One, the expansion of, of bike lane or, or spaces for cyclists and, and, and pedestrians it, are not against or maintaining our buses uh, what we need to do both. So I just want to be sure that, again, I share that with the public that I will also be listening to the TWU on any ideas and concerns that they can have uh, and I want to guarantee all New Yorkers, as we have done it before, we have seen the, our buses as the opportunity to turn buses as a above the ground trains in our city. So we would do both things together. Now, I will now have our moderator and committee council call on the administration to testify and to administer the oath. Thank you, Chair. Um, before I call on the administration, I'm going to go over some procedures for the hearing. Uh, I am Elliot Lynn. I'm counsel to the Transportation Committee at the New York City Council. Um, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify. At that point, you will be unmuted by the host. Um, please listen for your name to be called. I will be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and the chair will call you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to three minutes. Please also note that for ease of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of questioning. Thank you. Um, I'll now call on members of the administration. Um, from the Department of Transportation, Commissioner Polly Trottenberg, Deputy Commissioner for for Transportation Planning and Management, Eric Beaton, Assistant Commissioner of Intergovernmental and Community Affairs, Rebecca Zack, and from NYPD, Deputy Chief Michael Pilecki, and Assistant Deputy Commissioner Oleg Cherniavsky. 
I will now read the affirmation and then I will call on each individual to confirm their response to the affirmation on the record. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond on, honestly to council member questions? Uh, Commissioner Schottenberg? Yes. Uh, Eric Bjorton? Yes. Uh, Rebecca Zack? Yes. Uh, Deputy Chief Kalecki? Deputy Chief Kalecki? Not sure if we have him. Uh, Oleg Chernyavsky. Uh, yes, and uh, j just uh, just to note that I'm having technical difficulties with the camera, so I called in via conference call. Do we have Deputy Chief Pilecki on? He's here, but he's having audio issues. Okay. Um, thank you, and you may begin when ready. Well, I, th I think we were going to start with Chief Palacki. So, oh, there he is. I, if if we can't get the deputy chief on right now, could DOT start first, or? Um, sure, uh, although. Maybe give it one more second. I think we had okay. orchestrated PD comments. Would ours would follow theirs? And maybe if, if the chief isn't on, maybe Oleg can present the PD's testimony. Oleg, can you present the chief's testimony, or should we go on to DOT? Oleg, are you there? Yes, I'm, I'm here. Sorry. Uh, we're just having an issue. I, my computer's frozen as well, so I'm trying to pull up the testimony to read. Just uh, bear with me one second. Okay. Okay. Yeah, my, my apologies. Once I opened up Zoom on the laptop, it froze the computer. So to try to get to the uh, testimony is a little difficult. Uh, I see Deputy Chief Pilecki is holding up a sign. You're not muted, Chief Pilecki. You're 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 unmuted. If the deputy chief is having trouble with uh, accessing Zoom via the computer, he can also call in via phone. They're asking for the telephone number, Elliot. Okay. Deputy Chief, the number should have just been sent to you.
Can you hear us now? Can you hear us now? Yes, we can. I do. Yes, we can. Okay, very sorry about that. We had to bring in a tech uh, fellow to straighten things out. Okay, would you like me to begin? Yes, please. All right. Good morning, Chairman Rodriguez and Council Speaker Johnson. I'd like to first thank you both for your kind and thoughtful words about Chief Morris. Uh, members of the Council, I am Deputy Chief Michael Pilecki. I'm the Operations Chief of the Transportation Bureau within the New York City Police Department. In addition to my colleagues from the Department of Transportation, I'm joined today by Assistant Deputy Commissioner Ole Trebnowski. On behalf of the Police Commissioner, Dermot Shea, I would like to thank the Council for the opportunity to comment on Intro 1933 of 2020, which would mandate the closure or narrowing of 75 miles of city streets. The department wholly endorses the practice of responsible social distancing during this pandemic, and we've taken extraordinary measures to ensure that people using the city streets, sidewalks, and parks are acting appropriately and maintaining a self distance, a safe distance feet from each other. Last month, we detailed nearly 700 officers and supervisors to a task force specifically created to address this issue with the primary goal being to ensure those not observing social distancing do so. And these efforts have been overwhelmingly effective. Since the start of the emergency, we've taken minimal enforcement in those few incidents where all other efforts to gain compliance had failed. Today, I wanna to speak primarily to the overarching concern this legislation would pose to the NYPD, the level of manpower that we've been necessitated to ensure this proposal is executed safely. At the peak of this crisis just last week, the department had a daily sick count of over 7,000 officers or nearly 20% of our uniform officers. We are still seeing daily sick reports of between 4,000 and 5,000 officers, which is about four or five times higher than the norm. During these daily manpower deficits, we had to deploy our resources strategically to those areas most in need as conditions are changing day to day. Given these realities, deploying officers or agents to police an area that is roughly the equivalent of three full New York City marathon spans would not be possible. If the intent is to mimic the mixed use streets model that Oakland will be installing, then I would urge caution. This is a situation that has potential to severely impact public safety as pedestrians may be lulled into a false sense of safety and, com and, and um, compl um, complacency by streets that appear to be closed to traffic, but are in fact not. In addition, while Oakland announced it would be closing 74 miles worth of streets, it did not do so simultaneously, as this bill would have the city do. To date, nearly two weeks after it was first announced, roughly nine miles worth of roadway has been closed with limited information on its success. Even if we establish these areas without a fixed police presence, I feel compelled to mention that police officers will nevertheless be summoned to respond if 311 complaints are made that individuals are either not distancing or wearing face coverings. This is currently the case in public parks and essential businesses that have remained open throughout this national emergency. Moreover, closing streets, uh, closing that many streets would still require NYPB PD personnel to direct traffic in and around the street closures or restrictions. Likewise, of concern would be the permitting of pedestrians to walk in and shared roadways with motor vehicles and bicycles, who will all have the simultaneous right of way. The risk posed by such a model to pedestrians and bicyclists alike appear to be significant, especially in the absence of police presence. Regardless of what some may see as a success in Oakland, there is no one size fits all solution. We would not be able to deploy unmonitored barricades on the scale envisioned by this legislation, which will inevitably be moved and not replaced. Closing or restricting 75 miles of city streets is not the equivalent of a one day block party. This proposal appears to be a citywide measure with no particular end date and affecting nearly all areas of the city. 
Creating the model envisioned by the legislation without an adequate level of police presence is not workable and creating it with a police presence is not operationally realistic in today's climate. To ensure the safety of those who use our streets and to facilitate the flow of emergency vehicles, department would need to post an officer or traffic agent at every impacted intersection to enforce the restrictions and to move barriers when needed. In some ways, it's a catch-22. If we use movable barriers, there must be personnel present to ensure motorist compliance and to move those barriers for emergency vehicles and deliveries. If we use immovable concrete barriers, emergency vehicles, deliveries, and residents on those streets will be indefinitely rerouted and we must have personnel present to direct this traffic. Not to mention the valuable minutes ambulances, fire trucks, and police vehicles will spend taking alternate routes to respond to emergencies. If an immovable barrier is installed, which leaves enough space for that emergency vehicle to pass, we are back to square one and must place an officer or a traffic agent at that location to enforce the restriction. This is, of course, a complicated issue, and we should work together to come up with creative ways to provide individuals with functional public spaces they can use while maintaining safe distances. The department stands ready to work with the council and our sister agencies to ensure New Yorkers are afforded such spaces in a manner that does not require a significant investment of police resources or that would create situations that will require enforcement of emergency health and safety orders currently in place. I thank you for the opportunity to speak about this critical issue and we look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Would you like me to go next? Yes, please. Okay. Thank you, Chief Pilecki. Uh, good morning, Speaker Johnson, Council Member Rivera, Chairman Rodriguez, and members of the Transportation Committee. I'm Holly Trottenberg, Commissioner of the New York City Department of Transportation, and you heard joined by Deputy Commissioner for Traffic Planning and Management, Eric Beaton, and Assistant Commissioner for Intergovernmental and Community Affairs, Rebecca Zach. DOT and NYPD, thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of Mayor Bill de Blasio on the legislation before the committee tasking DOT with opening 75 miles of city streets up to pedestrians and cyclists during the COVID-19 pandemic. In recent years, DOT has been proud to aggressively design and implement hundreds and hundreds of street safety, bike lane, bus lane, and pedestrian plaza projects throughout the five boroughs. And we passionately share the goal of opening more of our city streets to mass transit bikes and pedestrians. During the COVID-19 crisis, New York City government is facing profound personnel, operational, and budgetary challenges. We've taken a hit like almost no other city in the world, and we're still grappling with the virus every day. We want to work closely with the council to find common ground on our shared goal of making many more miles of our streets and sidewalks safer and more available for New Yorkers seeking open space. But we ask the council recognize the many challenges and competing demands all of us in city government, especially the NYPD, are facing. As we all know, we are the epicenter of this global pandemic, and both NYPD and DOT, like many of our sister agencies, have felt the impact of the virus directly, with many employees infected, out sick, and some lost forever. And, and we certainly join with, with everyone here today, and our thoughts and prayers are with Chief Morris and, and with some of our own employees who, who are also hospitalized and gravely ill. Uh, you know, we've mourned the loss of colleagues and, and our hearts go out to, to all New Yorkers who've lost loved ones. And the crisis has certainly dramatically changed city streets. Street activity has plunged, which has led to one bit of good news. We've had the longest period without a pedestrian fatalities, I think 40 or 41 days since we began tracking by mode in 1983. But unfortunately, in our much emptier streets, some drivers are speeding recklessly, and we can never let up on our vigilance. DOT speed cameras have issued almost double the number of violations compared to before the crisis, and as the, the chart shows included in my testimony. And we're continuing our pace of installing 60 new speed cameras each month and plan to meet our goal of standing up the largest speed camera program in the world. At DOT, we're also maintaining the agency's critical functions, including emergency roadway bridge, sidewalk and traffic operations infrastructure repairs, as well as running the Staten Island Ferry 24 seven. 
and we're working closely with our union partners to ensure that our workforce is properly social distanced, well equipped and fully supported. You've heard Chief Pilecki testify that when closing streets, both agencies wanna prioritize public safety first and foremost, including the safety of all street users and ensuring safe operations for buses, trucks carrying supplies and emergency vehicles. Thus, while we share the underlying principles of the bill before the committee today, opening up 75 miles of streets to pedestrians and cyclists, about 800 blocks, uh, it, doing it in the time frame that the bill mandates would not be able to, would not be possible to do safely and effectively, given the significant strain all the relevant city agencies are under. Many supporters of extensive closures have cited Oakland's plans as a model New York City could follow. As, as Chief Pilecki noted, while Oakland announced it would discourage car traffic on 74 miles of streets on April 11, thus far as he testified that cities implemented fewer than 10 miles. And what Oakland is doing is discouraging but not completely prohibiting car traffic on its streets in phases at a deliberate pace and, and not all in a week. At DOT, we examined Oakland's model and see cities with some, some different realities and possibilities. Alameda County, where Oakland is located, has had fewer than uh, 1,350 known COVID cases, about 366 in Oakland, and 46 deaths countywide. Oakland's just one city in Alameda County, a, a small fraction of the number of people uh, compared to what New York has lost on a per capita basis. And I think we all know New York City is tragically still seeing more COVID fatalities every few hours than Alameda County has seen to date. Our agencies are therefore under a, a very different strain resource-wise, and I think Chief Pilecki spoke eloquently about that. And, and that makes us also want to be far more cautious about enforcing social distancing in any public spaces we create. Additionally, our, our cities are built very differently and our streets see disparate, disparate uses. New York City is the densest city in the country, a, a source of pride for us in good times with around 27,000 people per square mile citywide, almost 70,000 people per square mile in Manhattan, compared to 7,000 people per square mile in Oakland. The streets that will be opened up to, call, to pedestrians and bikes in Oakland are typically low density, single or multifamily residential streets where overcrowding is not a major concern. In contrast, New York City's density varies greatly by neighborhood and ensuring closed streets are equitably distributed, particularly in minority and low income communities will require closures in dense areas with complicated uses and higher traffic volumes. We think there are some challenges to the Oakland model, but we do wanna work with the council to find ways, given the city's current resource constraints, to create more miles of open space for pedestrians and cyclists, while not causing crowding that requires additional NYPD enforcement or significant disruptions to emergency vehicles, trucks carrying supplies or mass transit. We are currently evaluating multiple strategies to meet this need and hope in the coming days we can find common ground with you and other key stakeholders with whom DOT has also been talking. Beyond any temporary measures, which will be challenging to implement while the pandemic is still raging, we're starting to plan longer term about what our transportation system will look like when our city begins to reopen, including talking to our regional transit partners, business groups, experts, advocates, and our counterparts in other cities especially in Asia and Europe. We will face a new reality with many unknowns, but it will also present a unique moment to rethink our streets, both in the immediate recovery and over time, to ensure that they're safe, healthy, sustainable, more bike and pedestrian friendly, and supportive of a rekindled civic and economic life. We look forward to working with the council in the days and weeks ahead. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and we look forward to your questions. Thank you, uh, Speaker Johnson or Chair Rodriguez. Yes, <clears throat> hold on a moment. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner Trottenberg. Thank you, uh, Chief Pilecki as well. I wanna start uh, with the pilot program. I know you think it didn't work but I don't understand what uh, the administration would have considered a success. We didn't want the streets to be too crowded. That would defeat the point. So what were the metrics that were being looked at? What would a successful pilot have looked like? Do you really think that launching 
this pilot with barely a day's notice and running it for a few rainy cold days was giving it a fair shot. And if you had to do it again, would you run the pilot in the same way? Either uh, the deputy chief or the commissioner can answer that. I mean, I mean maybe we'll both we'll both take a, a crack. I, I, I can answer. Um, you know, no question. We we stood the pilot up quickly, and you know, this is a I think a, a learning curve that we're all on. I, I think obviously the, the measure of success is creating space that people can enjoy, but does not become so crowded that NYPD has to put a lot of enforcement. Um, yeah, but. Uh, you didn't put sugar on top of the creamer, did you? <laughs> in hearings. Um, I think obviously, and, and look, it, it got some criticism and I think it's something we're still thinking through how to, and I think Chief Pilecki talked to the dilemmas, how to create space that we know is safe, where we can accommodate emergency vehicles, trucks, things we need and not have it be so personnel intensive. We're exploring different ways to do that. The chief mentioned perhaps more permanent physical barriers. I mean, there are other ways we can do it, but I think that that is, I think that has proved the element of this that is the most challenging. I don't know what the chief would say. Chief Pilecki, you're- uh, Tough sign, can you hear me? Now we can hear you. Can okay. You hear you? So, I mean, listen, I would, I would agree with everything that the commissioner said. I think that preliminarily, when we looked at the amount of people that were out on the streets utilizing uh, the open spaces, there were not many at all. They were, uh, it was extremely, extremely light. So it seemed like, uh, although the uh, space was provided, it really was uh, very much underutilized. Uh, earlier this week, the mayor said that one reason we can't have street closures like the ones we're seeing on the West Coast is because driving culture is uh, different in California, that they're more likely to stop for pedestrians. What is that based on? Uh, do you have any data that you could share to back that up? Uh, I don't have any data that uh, can back that up. Uh, Commissioner? Uh, I mean, I guess I will say this. It, it's funny. Um... You know, we have seen some, in my, my time as commissioner, looking at Vision Zero, we've seen a lot of tragic crashes. And I have to say, I think a lot of irresponsible driving by New Yorkers. We are seeing speeding going up extraordinarily. The speed cameras that we have up are issuing twice as many tickets. So I, I don't know what the, the mayor was referencing in, to in terms of the West Coast, but I, I can say, um, I know it's something we've been talking to PD about, how, the, the level of confidence we have of doing a West Coast model where we just, you know, basically put up a sawhorse and hope that folks won't drive through it. Um, it, it is something I think we, we want to make sure if we do it here, we're doing it in a way that's safe. And it's not just the West Coast. Cities all over the U.S. and all over the world are ahead of us. How many different open streets programs has DOT and the NYPD looked at and evaluated? I mean, I, I think we've, I'm not sure, maybe my staff can jump in. We, we've probably looked at eight or nine of them. You know, again, I think I would reiterate from my testimony, many of the cities that we've looked at, and, and Oakland's a good example, have seen very, you know, luckily for them, and I, I wish we were, we were them, believe me, ve very little, um, you know, relatively little impact from the coronavirus, far fewer people sickened, far fewer people uh, dying. And so the, both their, their city government ranks, that they have much more people available. And I think less of a struggle with social distancing. All the other cities we've talked to at least don't have the same level of density as New York City. So um, we're learning from talking to other cities, but I do think we sort of face a particular set of challenges here in New York right now. And, and, and I think over time, you know, we have, you know, thank God started to see the, the curve easing off. Um, and, and that is wonderful news. And, you know, as, as was mentioned in the testimony, members of our workforces who were out sick, some are coming back and, and we will hopefully get back to being more uh, at full strength, but, but we're, we're not there yet. Have you looked at Milan? 
We have taken a look at Milan, yes. Um, and, and Northern that, Italy. That region of Italy, as we know, has been one of the hardest hit places. Right. No, no question. Planet. Northern Italy has been very comparable, probably in terms of the impacts. They are you know, further along the curve of coming out of it now than New York City. I think they're looking at doing my last read, and maybe there's, there's more developments here, about 22 miles of uh, bike and pedestrian routes. And, and again, I think we are, as we're saying in our testimony, very interested in working with you all on that. I just think you're hearing from us you know, particular struggles in this immediate moment with workforce and social distancing and, and PD resources. I, I hear that and I understand that, but what I haven't heard uh, in the testimony and what I haven't heard over the last uh, few days or few weeks are what are the administration's ideas? What, what ideas do you all have? I haven't seen anything proactive put forward by you all to say, okay, we are not the same as Oakland, we're not the same as Milan, we're New York City, but here are the things that we think we can do. Here are the places that we do think we can safely close. Here is the data that we're looking at. Here is where we have successfully done things like this in the past where we can start off. I haven't heard that. So I would like to hear that. I'd like to hear what your ideas are at this point, not here are the operational concerns. Those are real, we understand those. We can talk through those, but what are the ideas that you all have on what we can be doing? That's what I would like to hear. Well, I, I think you heard we, we alluded to some of them today. Um, you know, one is looking particularly at models that are not labor intensive. And that's Chief Pilecki mentioned, you know, particularly again, using more physical barricades, the challenges being um, to the extent that you are, you know, really making streets impermeable how do you make sure that you know it's not too much rerouting of emergency vehicles, ambulances, etc.? But I think that's one model that we're looking at, and the other, um, you know, certainly the Oakland model relies more on local neighborhood groups, you know, sort of nonprofit partners, uh, and, and I know bids and others have certainly. Uh, shown some interest and we've been talking to them. Um, you know, again, we want to make sure that things we do there would be safe. And I know Chief Pilecki has some thoughts on that. And just to be clear, the bill allows you, allows them to, allows you to do all of that. Everything that you just mentioned, the bill allows you to do that. We understand. And that's why I, I think, again, I think we can have a lot of common ground with you all on achieving the goals of the bill. Um, I just think you know, while we're still in a pandemic mode with ambulance racing through our streets, we, we want to make sure we get this right. But I just want to ask, when you all have been looking at other plans from other cities around the world, uh, what issues have you seen with emergency vehicles in places that have done uh, plans to allow for more uh, streets for pedestrians and cyclists and other folks? What issues I mean, have you identified for emergency vehicles? Right. I mean, I think in at least a lot of the other cities we've been looking at, th there's much less density and they are in sort of a different place in terms of hospitalizations, fatalities, and ambulances. I think if you look at cities that were in still very much the heat of the pandemic, some of those areas in northern Italy, uh, they hadn't sort of gotten to what they're looking at now, which is um, you know, changing streets. So I think it's been an evolution for them. I think it'll be an evolution for us. And, you know, again, I'll see if Chief Pilecki wants to add to that. Unmuted. Yeah. Uh, yep. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, I, I have not done an analysis of the emergency vehicles in other cities and how they're able to traverse the streets where we have these type of uh, closures uh, in place. So I really can't speak to that. Um, with regard to suggestions you had asked, hey, what kind of suggestions do you have? As the commissioner had mentioned, you know, we want to work with the council in coming up with a program that would be safe, that would be uh, not labor intensive or would not require uh, NYPD resources being deployed. Um, there's a few things that we had discussed that, uh, you know, maybe we can uh, come together on. Uh, when you looked at these other cities, was there an increase in traffic crashes or fatalities? 
I mean, I think most of them are just getting started and I haven't really had a chance to, to pour over their statistics. I, I know Eric Beaton, uh, one of my deputy commissioners is here. I don't know if he wants to add to that. I think for a lot of them, it's just been sort of a week or two. Um, Were there any, have you, have yeah, you seen it, any problems because of lack of enforcement? I don't know, Eric, if you have anything to add to that. Sure. So the, the other cities have very much used models like what we've talked about with Oakland, and that's been true, whether it's Burlington, Minneapolis, you know, there's a list of, of cities that re they, they inherently rely on very little enforcement because they don't actually prohibit any vehicles from the streets, which means that there's no issue with emergency response or that sort of thing. But it also means that there's potential conflicts on the streets. And they very much use single family, low density, extremely low density areas of those cities. So when we look at New York, just the, even in our on pause state, the number of trucks, the number of emergency vehicles, the number of even private cars of people going places is substantially higher. And so we're trying to learn what we can from those cities. And we've absolutely been talking to them and seeing what works and what doesn't in a very short amount of time. But the land use is really pretty different and having the, our streets, you know, imagine a, a Manhattan or a, an inner Brooklyn or Queens street, it, you know, there's just a lot more activity going on that we want to make sure is either accommodated or not in some safe way. Are we, are we letting the perfect become the enemy of the good? I mean, how, how do you, you know, it sounds like you're setting a bar that is so high that it's, that it's impossible to actually clear. It's just hard for me to understand when you step back and you talk about this issue more generally, you know, for a minute that there are, this is happening in other big cities, as you said, other dense cities, maybe not as dense as here, other cities that have a lot of drivers, other cities that rely on deliveries, other cities that need emergency vehicles to get around. Do you all believe that New York City is so different from all those other cities that we can't apply any of those lessons here? I don't believe that, but I, I do believe at the moment we're, we're different from at least every city in the United States and mostly around the world in the severity of what we're experiencing with the coronavirus. Um, in, in that regard, I, I think we are a tragic outlier. The, the level of, of infection and, and fatalities and needs for medical supplies is, I think in that regard, we're pretty different. I, I hope over time, we all pray that will change and, and we want to find ways to, you know, accommodate it in our city streets as it does. But um, I think that is in talking to a couple of my fellow DOT commissioners, that's a very different reality we have here in New York City, unfortunately. So if you step back for a moment and you uh, just think generally about the city, it's not, you know, and about this issue, it's not just about getting more space for people to exercise, to get fresh air. Uh, it is, uh, this is also about recreation. A lot of New Yorkers still need to go out and shop for food, to do laundry, for essential workers to get to work. And they need to be able to do that safely. Uh, do you know what percentage of the sidewalks in New York City are at least six feet wide? Um, we were, I was trying to get an answer to that uh, question before the hearing. I, I don't know if we dug it out, but I, I mean, I'm going to say there's probably a very good percentage of sidewalks in New York City that if you count trees and street furniture and other things, it's, you're not going to have a perfectly, you're not going to have an ability to perfectly clear six feet between two folks. And, and, and I, you know, what I've seen New Yorkers being adaptable and stepping out of each other's ways and crossing the street and, and look, we, we know as the weather gets warmer, this is, this is going to be a bigger challenge, but I think most old cities have large proportions of sidewalks that are pretty narrow. It's definitely a challenge we're all going to face. Um, just a couple more questions. Uh, I actually think that we've been lucky when it comes to weather. We've only had a handful of warm, sunny days this spring, but we are heading into May. And if we're still in the situation when uh, when we get to May or get to June, uh, you're going to have a lot of kids with a lot more free time once the official school year ends. We've closed play playgrounds. It looks like pools and beaches may not be available in the way that they have been in the past this summer. 
What's our plan to make sure New Yorkers have some options other than a park? Are you all working with the Parks Department and with City Hall on potential contingency plans to allow for more space for New Yorkers? I mean, I, I know that that is that, that the, the exact issues you're raising, Mr. Speaker, are, are certainly under discussion uh, at City Hall with all the relevant agencies. And, and I think you know the mayor made none of those decisions lightly about closing playgrounds and other things. He is, as a, as a parent, very sympathetic to the, the needs of kids to get out and get exercise. And we know the warmer weather is coming. So there is, I think, a lot of thinking and planning uh, going on and how we're, gonna, how we're gonna address that. Okay. Um, well, I, I look forward to hearing your ideas. I mean, I haven't heard a plan from you all. We've been talking about this for weeks. And I would have thought that you all would have come in today and said, we've identified X number of streets that cover X number of miles where we think that we can actually do this. And uh, I hope that that's what will happen in the coming days. So I wanna thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I turn it back to you and the committee council. I thank you, Commissioner Trottenberg and Deputy Chief Pilecki. And I look forward to hearing from the other members and the members of the public today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Speaker Johnson. Uh, I guess first, I would like to, you know, be clearly from my end. Uh, we are not, I not, as someone that represents a heavily Latino district and someone that been spending hours and hours walking around the Bronx in Manhattan, knowing that even though when we know someone who died a well-known person, you make it to the newspaper. But when you look, even when we get the lower numbers of people dying on the 400, it still is like too much. And we know that now, we use, now we're used to the hundreds of people dying every day. It's not just about the five, the 10, or the 50. So those individuals who are now well-known and we don't want anyone from the 8.6 million people to die. I'm also thinking they are the poorest one. They are the one as you know, close to 40%, they're Latino. They are from Americans, they're Asian. And poor individual, beside the few who we don't want either to die. So by no means, in my case, I'm looking at reopening the city of New York in these days. I think that if the numbers of people dying still right now and hundreds of thousands of people, Speaker Johnson, that we have no track on people that deal with the coronavirus. Like the city of New York, the state of New York, we don't have the number of how many people call 311 and they say we have a symptom of the coronavirus and they've been, they've been told stay in your apartment. And as I said before, it's not an apartment of someone that working hard being able to get a large apartment. It's someone, as I share the story of 11 people who live in Nago with 10 people who live together in apartments in the Bronx in the same number that you will see, especially in the poorest neighborhood. So when I, again, believe on closing or opening the street to pedestrian and cycling, first of all, the pilot project that we did I think that we put ourselves to fail. I think that to look at, yes, closing few blocks at Grand Concourse, few blocks at Manhattan, it was not ambition to say, let's close the whole the streets. Let's identify area close to the park. Yes, we did in Central Park, I mean, on Park Avenue, but it was not the same Grand Concourse in other areas. So I think, again, first, definitely I support this Bill co-prime by Speaker Johnson, Councilmember Cabrera, and other my colleagues, because I think that we need to have this conversation. But I want to be clear that even though some people will be talking about we need to start looking at reopening the streets, don't bring that conversation to the poorest neighborhood. Don't go to the South Bronx or Washington Heights or Queens, Brooklyn, and Staten Island, where there's hundreds of thousands of people that they call living together in a apartment, dealing with the coronavirus. And when you check at the hospital, 
any hospital you ask, how many people call through 311? And you already track those people as someone that they had the coronavirus. No one has put that information to them. So, and even though, again, as we heard the Bloomberg, we've been leading that team to track, I said from day one, please sit in the front table, the leaders and the faces of the Latinos and the Black and the Asian community who are the one dying. So in this plan, in this bill, as we're discussing ideas to reopen the street, I call the non-Black and Latino brothers and sisters, you know, the, 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 the stakeholder, to please, let's look at the top priority. Area that we have as the transportation desert. Communities that we have that they don't have access to buy expensive bike or to pay for the city bike. And let's not look about the NYCHA program across the board. Look, stop at some, place, at some point at the corner in Manhattan, in Brooklyn. Look at the faces of the cyclists. Count how many are black and Latino. We are many of them delivering food, but when it came to getting to the bike, working, using the bike as a motor transportation, I like I will be working with my colleagues to be sure that in this plan of opening the 75 miles, that we look first at those communities that in this time of coronavirus, most people who are dying, who are getting the coronavirus, first they're dealing with asthma and obesity. So question to you, Commissioner Sean Breeze, as someone that also know very well, as I have said before, not only the city, but our country, and with a bailout that will provide opportunity, our larger hospital, they will not be doing so bad. Many of them, they will be getting 100,000 of 100 millions of dollars, even close to $1 billion larger hospital will get. And I think that this plan also has to be seen from the perspective of health. So as we know that there's gonna be some costs involved, do you see, and as both of you, the chief and, and the commission have been saying that you open to work with a speaker, to work with, all, with council member Cabrera and the whole council to continue this conversation with this bill. Do you see an opportunity to bring the hospital to the table? So as I know, Columbia Private Stadium, they will get close to $1 billion. That's the expectation in this bailout plan. So they also should take some of those money and put the money together if there's any cost involved, again, in the surrounding area. So what opportunity do you see also to bring the hospital to work together to spend some money to make this plan a reality? Well, look, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you because, as you know, we, we've worked with you on Columbia Presbyterian and, and improving, you know, access to bike share. And we're going to do that with some of the other hospitals uh, in northern Manhattan and the Bronx. And I think we, we've been having a good dialogue with the hospitals and, and Greater New York Hospital Association throughout the crisis, helping them with parking and transportation and other needs. So, so I think, obviously, you're absolutely right. We should we should bring them in to this dialogue, I, I, you know, I've certainly heard from various institutions around the city uh, who have an interest in working with us going forward and the hospitals, I think will be key players in that. Do you, do you, do you feel that if again, if we get this bill, move on, and of course I support Pika Johnson, Kalina and the rest of my colleagues, do you see, oh, a opportunity also to expand those street, giving more space in the street to cyclists and pedestrians in underserved community? Or do you understand why is that so important in underserved community? I mean, I, I, I think Mr. Chairman, you're right in, in you know, as we've looked at, and, and I hear that the, what the speaker's saying, we're not laying out a lot of specifics today, but I do think we want to sit down as soon as possible with the council and talk through more specifics. And we totally recognize how important it is uh, to make sure that underserved communities are benefiting from open space. And you know, it's part of why as much as again, we've seen some of the bids who, who wanna volunteer and in a lot of the low income neighborhoods around the city, you know, the bids may not be well resourced or able to help make these types of, of projects happen. And we wanna make sure that the city can be there to help. So again, an area we certainly want to talk to the council about as, as soon as possible. Okay. 
I, I again, I, I assure that as we continue conversation, as I believe in any area, and also we leave that experience after 9-11, that when, when it was time to sit down and think about ideas and suggestions to come out out of the other other crisis at this time also. And, and I feel, and this is one thing that I've been calling, I'm calling to my white progressive New Yorkers to understand that sometimes they have to step out sometimes for some space and create the opportunity to sit on the front line, those individuals, those institutions who are not block by, block by block, you know, where are those people who are dying? And I think at this moment, we have seen one more time that the city of New York, unfortunately, when you see who are dying, they are the poorest one. Who are dying, those people, they have not access to the to bicycle, to buy the bike, or to pay the monthly fee for city bike. And I think, or, or to rent it or buy an electrical car. So again, I hope that we will be able to work around this bill, but I also want to be sure that the city of New York, for God's sake, understand that, you know, sometimes being in leadership position is a privilege. And I think that we need to share that space, especially discussing the need to open the street. Not everyone lives across a park. Not everyone is in a position to say, you know, I can walk in this park together with my one or two children. We're talking about most people dying, they live in overcrowded apartments. Most of the people dying, they live in transportation areas. Most of those people dying, they live close to the crossroads. And yes, asthma, obesity, and diabetes are so associated with most people who are sweet holding this here right now, they are dying in hospital. So, espero de nuevo que todos trabajemos para ayudar a salvar a nuestra gente. Y si hablamos de abrir las calles de la ciudad de Nueva York, no es ahora, ahora tenemos que mantenernos cerrados para que se cure nuestra gente. Pero cuando hablamos de sentar y abrir conversaciones, los latinos también y los afroamericanos tienen que estar sentados a, hacer, a tener una silla en esta discusión. Thank you. Now I would like to ask a call on a, the, one of the co-prime on this field together to get your song, Council Member Kalina. Hi, I just want to, is there a timer? No, you can take your time. The rest of the colleagues, they will have three minutes, but the co prime is, don't worry about the time. Don't worry, I won't take too much time. I know there's a lot of people that want to ask questions and there's a long list of advocates that I certainly want to get to because I think that their input is going to be important. As we're all saying, this is, this is to promote safe social distancing. Not every neighborhood is going to um, utilize a, a, a program like this at, compared to many, many others. So I just want to follow up on a couple of things. I, I want to reiterate what the speaker said in terms of, of being a bit disappointed. You know, there there is really no plan from the Department of Transportation. There really is nothing presented after all of these weeks, after the pilot, 1.6 miles, I believe was the original pilot, which I thought was already way too limited in scope and was not implemented. I, I think with the community, the way that it should have been would have led to more success. So just a few questions. And again, I'm also disappointed in some of the comments and, and that, that people in terms of the trust in New Yorkers. And I just ask that we, we can tell when streets are open. We can assess our own communities and where we can go and what's the safest thing for our families. We may still have challenges, but, but as you've seen, many of us have significantly changed our behavior even overnight. And so I think this is just one program as a part of a long-term solution that we've kind of been exploring historically with summer streets and play streets. And you have some of these streets as, as places that continue to be closed every year. So I don't know why we can't just start with some of those recommendations, but I'm gonna just ask a few questions. So in terms of the pilot, you know, you mentioned timing to, to implement things. It's already been many, many weeks. Can you share at least any data points that you collected as part of the pilot review? No, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I, un the, you mean the, the, the four sites we tested? Is there anything that you learned that you are perhaps applying to a program that you seem to want to collaborate with us on, but has yet to be unveiled? I mean, I think I'll turn to the chief. I mean, I think the, the, the challenge we had was how to do it in a way that was not so PD intensive. And I, I, 
I'm not sure we obviously found quite the right formula. I don't know, Chief, if you want to. I absolutely agree with that. I mean, we want to sit down with the council. We want to come to a consensus on a plan that is not labor intensive to the NYPD. Um, and we, again, just want to stress that there is uh, a danger involved in uh, not staffing an intersection and relying solely on barricades to prevent vehicles from turning onto the streets that we're going to close to prevent them from turning onto those streets and injuring people. Uh, it's not a question of not trusting New Yorkers. New Yorkers are great people. But we know that there could be a small percentage of people who, for whatever reason, might want to get onto that block and move the barrier and drive onto the street and maybe not put the barrier back, which would invite other cars to turn onto the street at well, and it would present a danger to people. I can't tell you how many times or details that I've worked where we've had police tape up, uh, interior crime scenes uh, tape up, and it's clear as day, wrapped around perhaps a tree, maybe taking out half a block, and people will walk up and see that tape, they'll lift it up and just walk right through. So there are people who will disregard barriers, there are people who will disregard signs, and our concern is just, again, that it, it just poses a safety risk to the people who are gonna be utilizing these streets. I just ask that we not categorize the public for a few of the bad actors. You do have movable barriers, you have used uh, similar measures are often used for construction projects with fairly limited enforcement or oversight needed in, the, in those cases. So I think we can implement something similar. But if the question is, is staffing, if staffing is a concern, how far does the curve need to be lowered for work to begin on this? Milan and Northern Italy have has seen a few weeks, has been a few weeks ahead of us. So this is something you can do in a few weeks. I know you mentioned seven days as being a concern, and I just want to note on, on, on the density, Milan, which is implementing a similar program, as was mentioned by the speaker, is so dense, it would be the second densest in the nation. So how much time would you need to be able to do something like this? And if you've noticed in the bill, there is also a reporting structure so that we can review this and figure out whether, one, it's working, which I think it will be successful because we want to use community groups, and two, maybe there are certain areas where it could be more of a long-term solution. I think that before we can give you some type of time estimate, we would first have to sit down with the council and DOT and together come to a consensus with regard to the amount of roadway that would be involved, the location of the roadways that would be involved, and then once that's determined, figure out what the staffing levels would be at that point and how we could police these, these streets with a minimal amount of, of resources. So there was a note in the testimony that there hasn't been a single traffic fatality for the last 40 days, the longest period of time without a fatality in the history of tracking this information. A single pedestrian fatality. One. There was I'm, I'm just saying not, not all traffic fatalities. We, we have had a motorist fatality, but a single pedestrian fatality. Well, I, no, I appreciate you correcting me because every single every single fatality that we've experienced during this is someone's loved one. So I, I appreciate the correction. Uh, doesn't that show that our streets are safe enough currently for an open streets program in the right areas? I mean, I, I will say I think it's it's I feel like the data is challenging for us because on the one hand because so many people are staying home and, and you all are correct the weather has helped us we've had kind of a cold and rainy april people have not been out but speeding has been pretty extraordinary and i think anyone who has spent a little time walking around the streets of new york i've seen some cars engaging in some pretty reckless behavior so i think it is as we're encouraging people to come out and be in the street, I think you're hearing from the chief, we just wanna make sure we're doing it safely. I don't, I think there are ways we can come up with a model. We're very committed to working with you all on it, but there are just some competing tensions there. And I think for all of us, um, we just never would wanna see a situation where we were leaving people to believe it was safe to be out in the street. And we had motorists who, um, you know, inadvertently, or maybe even a bad actor did did something dangerous. I'd like to make a couple of points, if I might. Just, I'd like to address the issue of speeding. Um, we had obviously identified the fact that there was an uptick in speeding earlier in April. So starting on April 7th, we, um, we kind of shifted gears a bit and we deployed more highway cars to, to conduct radar enforcement. Um, so from 320 to 46, the average number of speed summonses issued by highway patrol was 115. 
after we stepped up our increased enforcement from 4.7 to 4.19, the average number of speed summonses issued by Highway Patrol went up to 222 a day. So it's over 100 speed violation summonses being issued on our highways since we stepped up our uh, increased enforcement. In addition to that on the highways, we deployed additional cars from our citywide traffic task force. These are the cars that don't ordinarily patrol on the highways, but patrol instead on the local streets. We deployed them to the highways throughout the city, and we have them patrolling in the left-hand lane of the highways with their turret lights on to physically slow down cars on the highways. To, and, and we found that cars are extremely reluctant to pass these cars for fear of getting a summon. So that seems to be working out very well. We have an increase in speed summonses that are being issued. We have more highway officers coming back to work from sick. We had a high of 50 uh, highway patrol officers out at one point. We're down to about 20 now. So we're getting more resources out there in the field. And just one other thing with regard to commission of the, the DOT speed cameras, we found that um, taking a look at the data, and just bear with me one second. So the speeds identified by the DOT speed cameras seem to have peaked on April the 6th. There was 200, I'm sorry, 2.03 million cars passed the, cam the cameras on that day with 31,911 or 1.59% of the vehicles exceeding the limit. It, it steadily reduced from April the 6th to the point where on April the 21st, 2.05 million cars passed the cameras, which was uh, 24,541 were exceeding the limit, which was 1.3. So that's a nice reduction. That 24,541 on April 21st relates a 24% reduction in speeders from the 31,000 number. So on the side streets, we're showing some, some encouraging uh, data, and we're, we're cautiously optimistic that that, train will con that trend will continue. In addition, we have offices from our citywide traffic task force who are deployed to specific locations throughout the city, strategic locations, conducting stepped up speed enforcement. So we're really kind of doing everything that we think we can be doing to try to get people to slow down and, and drive within the speed limit. Um, and just again, where you had talked about the number of vehicles out there, uh, again, the speed camera uh, 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 data indicates on January 6th to January 10th, the average weekday number of cars passing those cameras was 3.08 million, and we're down uh, to 2.03 million on April the week of April 13th to April 17th. So there's still a substantial number of cars out there, although it is down over a million. I just want to ask a clarifying question because you gave us a lot of uh, percentages and statistics right now, which I certainly appreciate. It's not every hearing we get actual numbers. Uh, so you mentioned the speeding on the highways. So were the increases in vehicle speeds seen uniformly across the city? Does it differ on, on highways and avenues? You said something about the side streets. So um, I, I spoke with all of our highway commanders around that time and I turned out the uh, platoons to address the officers personally. And based on what they were seeing at the time throughout the city, they had noticed an uptick in, in speeding violations. So it wasn't particular to one specific borough. And again, I'm talking about the highways, not the side streets. Well, you know, I just feel like there's also a, a opportunity here on messaging. I mean, I, I know that this is an unprecedented time, but even something like a citywide slow zone, you know, just letting people know how careful they should be when people are trying to take walks. Let me just ask very, very uh, quickly on, on some of the the staffing, um, how many school crossing guards are currently still doing work related to school safety? That I can answer. Maybe Oleg, if you're on, you can you can touch on that. Yeah, I think we're going to have to um, we're going to have to get back to you with that number. Well, I know that some of you have that information, Oleg. I mean, I know there I know that uh, there's still there's programs running out of certain schools. Um, you, you know, with respect to uh, pick up lunches and, yes. uh, and but, yeah, but I mean, so you, I, I know that, that's not any, that's not a difficult number to get. Like how many, no, no, I'm not saying schools, I'm not saying it is deployed to other places. Okay. Yeah. I'm not saying it's a difficult number. I just don't have it, but I'll have it for you today. I don't, I don't think that's going to be a problem to get. So, and really quickly, did you say there was speeding on our side streets or you found that number, that low number? to be a good thing. So council member, we, we 
utilizing the data provided by DOT speed cameras, uh, again, on April the, I believe it was the 6th, the, um, the vehicles driving in excess of the limit past those cameras peaked. And I'm just trying to get my notes here. Okay, the, uh, on, on April the 6th, 2.03 million cars passed DOT speed cameras. 31,911 or 1.59% exceeded the limit. That's when the number of vehicles exceeding the limit peaked. It's decreased or declined to the point where on 421, 2.05 million cars passed the cameras. 24,541 or 1.3% exceeded the limit. So, the, and that's also when you consider the fact that DOT has been adding 60 cameras per month, the reduction is even more impressive. So when you take that number, that 24,000 number, and you compare that to the 31,000 number, it's a 24% decrease. I, I think, and I, I hear you. But the what? point I guess I'm trying to make, and I don't mean to interrupt you, and I apologize for that, is that we're trending in the right direction. And we want to continue to trend into the, in the right direction. Our resources have been stretched very, very thin. Our offices in the precincts that ordinarily do traffic safety and every precinct has a traffic safety team offices who focus on this this type of thing uh, because of the reduction in staffing levels they haven't been able to give the focus that they ordinarily would give because they're doing they're responding to radio calls uh, etc so we see this as a positive indicator that things are trending in the right direction I guess that's the point well, I was trying to make. I understand. I, I just don't think we really have the data on what kind of streets those cameras are located on, unless you can help us out I, I, with a map, an easy to read map. We could use um, a breakdown on street speeds based on those kinds of streets. And when you say that the resources are stretched thin, I totally understand. But what we're trying to put forward one, well, one, let me just say, I understand your resources are stretched thin, but I did ask you for a simple number of school crossing guards and, and you could not get me that number. Oh, I don't and know that number. I didn't, I didn't come prepared to discuss school crossing guards. Well, I would say that I have been very vocal in saying that I think a, a, a program to be, to be implemented mm -hmm. successfully would utilize traffic enforcement agents, school crossing guards, as well as community-based organizations, civic and block associations, business improvement districts, and, and, and a whole host of many others who are supporting this program. So uh, let me just go to, to sidewalks very quickly. Uh, Polly, uh, Commissioner Trottenberg, according to your own street design manual, minimum widths for sidewalks are five feet in residential areas and eight feet in dense areas. Do you believe this needs to be updated after the pandemic ends? Your testimony did say that this was a needed improvement and that we had common ground. Well, look, I think here is the challenge we face. Um, I think it was alluded to at some point during the, the testimony today. New York City has 12,000 miles of sidewalks. And, you know, in some places they're quite wide, but in some places where they're wide, populations are very dense. In some places they're quite narrow and populations are very light. And then there's a whole mixture in between. I think as we do our planning and obviously work with the council and, and start to work our way out of this pandemic. We wanna focus most intensely on places where we think the crowding on sidewalks is gonna be a real danger. And, and look, we've all been looking at the, the epidemiology and, and sort of the nature of how we're supposed to walk by each other in the pandemic. And, and it seems like one of the biggest deciding factors in transmission is duration of encounter. Uh, if you walk by someone in hopefully one second or two, you're both wearing masks, that, that doesn't seem to be a big vector. No question if people get squished together, that starts to be a vector. And, um, you know, we're going to have to take a look. I think it's going to be different neighborhood by neighborhood. I think the places where we see the most density is where obviously, and we've, DOT started to do some of this, 7th Avenue and Flushing and other places. We are going to want to widen sidewalks in the parts of the city where we see the biggest population density. Well, I just want to reiterate that, you know, my calls with doctors and nurses and frontline staff who are just despondent at some of the images they've seen in, in crowded parks, they're just, they're just infuriated and they're working really, really hard. And I think that based on street closures that have already existed, based on the, the desperate need for, for proper social distancing, 
um, that this could be a program that could really, really be successful. And you said that there is common ground. You said you want to work together. I hope that that is, uh, uh, becomes a reality. I, I just have one last question because, and thank you, Mr. Chair. I know there's people with many, many questions. Will the DOT and NYPD be producing or has it already produced a written report on the results of the pilot program? This goes back to my data question. And can that be shared with us and posted for the public to review? Um, I, I don't think we ever did a formal written report. I mean, I, I think we would concede right here it was a quick and not entirely perfectly done um, pilot project. I, I don't know whether PD ever did anything formal. Yeah, I, I don't believe that we did. Okay, well, I would just, um, again, I, I'm looking forward to working with you on this. It, it seemed like you were interested. I, I realize that each open street can look very, very different. Um, not everyone has a backyard. There are families cramped into apartments. Sidewalks are very, very narrow. And I think we can all be a, a, a leader finally. I mean, we're behind many, many cities. But in terms of what we can do in our open space and some of the support, I think we can be a leader in this country and really looking out for those families that need the space to just promote a healthier and safer New York City. So thank you uh, to the Deputy Chief for, for your testimony. Thank you, Commissioner Trottenberg, and I'm looking forward to getting this done. Thank you, Council Member. So are we. Thank you, uh, Council Member Kalina Rivera. Uh, Speaker Johnson, I don't know if you have any additional questions to follow up before we call to the, uh, our other colleagues. Uh, just one, one very, very quick question. You know, uh, Deputy Chief and, and Commissioner, in Central Park, uh, you guys have been putting up a single tiny small barrier to block cars from coming into Central Park. It is not very big. Are you getting reports that cars are violating that? That people are entering Central Park and violating that barrier that exists? Cops are not stationed there. There's no enforcement personnel. You have a sign that's there that says, do not enter with a very tiny barrier that doesn't even take up the whole thing. Are you getting reports that cars are violating that and entering the roadways in Central Park because you don't have substantial barriers and you don't have cops, police officers at every single entrance to Central Park? I am not aware of any uh, reports of that nature. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair, thanks. Thank you. And, and before calling on our colleague, Councilmember Cabrera, Menchaca, Ku, and Cohen, I just want to uh, ask a question to Commissioner Polly Tromber, which is do, do you see a, and, and first I would like to, you know, explain my thought before asking the question, which is at my age, in my 11 years as a council member, we had learned that we are, we had to develop, you know, always foundation to be united. And we will win this battle by being united as a city. But I can tell you that one thing that I'm committed myself in the names of all those faces of people that they been dying, especially those, the poorest one that I will dedicate my time in government, or if I go back on teaching, if I do whatever in my life, to fight against inequality in a city that now is showing a face worldwide, that there's a lot more that we gotta do. And I know that we have a big heart, and we need to work hard to push our agenda, to lift up and bring opportunity to all New Yorkers. But it's not a secret, and I know that everyone knows. In 2020, we have built a city of the two New Yorkers still today. Like even with City Bike, when City Bike was created, it was not intended to think about the poorest neighborhood. It was intended more to the upper class and middle class New York. And I would like to see from now on especially those of us, the men and women, the NYPD, the doctors, the nurses, the EMS. By the way, they should be paid more. They show it one more time that they're in the front line saving lives. 
and all of us in different roles that we're playing, that whatever we do, please, in the name of the future generation to come, in the name when we celebrate Martin Luther King, everything that we do should be based more on me than being popular. I feel that, you know, any policy, any legislation that we move should be focused about where do we need it the most? Because even in, make, in, every, in order to make it popular, we need to invest, educating the poorest New Yorkers about the benefit of riding a bike, about the benefit of walking down the street. Instead of, you know, like, just only thinking in one area where we have largest and more support. So how do you think, again, and when you say we open to sit on the table to walk around this legislation, on this and many other legislation, how can we aim our thought? Not to think about if we move this bill, think about later on to sit on the table and planning where it's more popular, but where are those things needed the most? So if you think about opening a street to cyclists and pedestrians, and it's so related to people dying, and there's a pattern of people dying and having asthma and obesity and being poor, will you commit to bring, again, your experience, to think about putting in policy, ideas and suggestions around this bill. So we start looking at underserved communities, not necessarily what is more popular. I mean, absolutely, Mr. Chairman. I, I think, and I know the mayor and, and many members of the council have, have spoken eloquently about um, you know, how we have seen the, the coronavirus has shown us what we all know, the, the tremendous social and economic disparities in the city. And, and I think, you know, it has been heartbreaking to see the disproportionate effect that this disease has had on minority populations. By the way, that's been true in the, the city workforce as well. Um, and of course, I, I think one of the main goals of this program is we want to design it to target those communities most in need, where we see the most crowding, where we're seeing the biggest health impacts and, and getting that model right, wanting to make sure that we're also, you know, in places though, in those communities where there are hospitals and other things that we're in, ensuring that we have good access to those. So I think we all share that that would be a very important goal with designing this program as we go forward. We certainly commit to you on that. Yeah, but when we're, where we see more crowding is in the midtown area. You know what I mean? Where we see more the need, if you just let us, you know, what we have seen as what we will guide us, assuming that we can work and pass this bill and measure to sign, we not start in the area where more people be hurt with this virus. And I just want, I think that we open, I think that, you know, from the speaker listening to you, I know that we care for that. But I have seen over and over, as I said, Look at the cyclist community. The lift and the and the lift and the bike share, whatever I said before, they need to put their dollar to bring educational initiatives in the underserved community. Because we have created that condition for cyclists to be seen as something of the middle class and the upper class. And the faces of the 35% New Yorkers who live in poverty are the one that we have seen dying large numbers. So, you know, I want to encourage that, you know, we can explain it, we can say, well, all, we all care for this. We are all in the same boat. But if you go to the underserved community, it's a different reality. And I just want to see how, again, I want to highlight it so that we can have that in mind. That there's a right. level of frustration. And, and Mr. Chairman, look, there, there's no question, you know, City Bike, which, which started now seven years ago, it started in the dense parts of Manhattan. I, I think we've, you know, we are now on track to double the service area. And as you know, this summer, we are on track. That's one piece of essential work we're going to keep doing, um, bringing more bikes and more stations all the way up in Manhattan into the South Bronx. So 
you know, we, we keenly recognize we need to keep expanding the system and make it affordable for low income folks and do all the education and outreach that we need to, to encourage folks to ride. We're, we're very enthusiastic about that mission. Thank you, Commissioner. Now let's hear from the council members. Uh, we will put the clock in three minutes. Council Member Cabrera, followed by Council Member Minchaca, Ku, and Coyne. Council Member Cabrera, as a quick reminder to council members, if you would like to ask a question, please use the raise hand function on Zoom. Council Member Cabrera, your time will begin now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And may I suggest in the future, we have a little longer than three minutes, uh, waiting almost two hours to ask a three minute question to have a uh, real discussion with the administration for three minutes uh, is a bit unrealistic. Uh, but let me just uh, ask literally just one question, which only have time for here. In order to Council avoid- Member, Council Member Cabrera, let's- Yes, sir. Following suggestion, let's please put the clock in five minutes so that Thank we you. can have more time. That's much appreciated. And I'll, I'll try to uh, use as little as possible of it. Thank you so much. Uh, in order to avoid uh, a sharp increase in car travel, as the city uh, uh, will begin to open in, in the future or near future, uh, we need to provide uh, transportation uh, alternatives. Uh, we know that New York State has legalized e-scooters and e-bikes. Uh, will the city, will the administration embrace the e-bikes, e-scooters as an alternative mode of transportation? Um, good to see you, Councilmember Cabrera. And I, I think you know the administration supported uh, Albany's efforts. We were supportive of the legislation that the governor has just signed. It requires action by the council. Uh, there's a local option, but, but we're enthusiastic about talking to you all about that and, and coming up with the a plan that's gonna work for the city. So for sure, we, we certainly recognize the bigger point you're making. Uh, as we come back out of this crisis, we have to think about mobility, making sure people feel safe getting back on mass transit, certainly accommodating more biking and walking as well. Well, Commissioner, it warms my heart and I know all of the transportation alternative advocates applaud you. Uh, looking forward to having a conversation with you. Uh, and of course, with our council uh, staff uh, to making that a reality. Thank you so much. I didn't use the whole time, uh, but uh, Mr. Chair, thank you for the extra time. I really appreciate it. You only used two minutes. <laughs> Councilmember Menchaca, followed by Councilman Miku and Corn. Councilmember Menchaca, your time will begin now. It looks like Councilmember Menchaca is not there, so we follow by Councilmember. Hello, uh, can you hear me all? We do now, yes. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm just gonna also jump on the sentiment of equity that we really restructure how our council hearings go. Um, at this point, three Manhattan council members have dominated the time. Uh, and I think the equity question is gonna be an important thing to move beyond. Uh, and I think we can do something different. So I'm looking forward to working with all of you to figure out how we, how we solve that equity time to distribute it, not just to council members, but folks who are gonna help us solve these problems on the ground, like our advocates, um, because I think they know what we know, which is this, um, the COVID is changing everything. And I'm not worried about the planning issues. We're gonna hear from the advocates. So I'm not gonna spend time there. Uh, I'm gonna focus my questions on Deputy Chief uh, Pilecki and the NYPD's response. I think that there's a labor issue that you're claiming but we just saw uh, the mayor decimate SYEP and all the summer programming. And I believe that more policing is not good, uh, not the right signal that we need to send to the communities. And SYEP would be a great place to relaunch a youth program this summer to get them uh, into this conversation, to hire them, to pay them, to train them, to let them be part of our neighborhood uh, based response. And so I'm not worried about the planning issues. I think the planning issues can get solved. It's really kind of getting through you all that, that it doesn't mean that we need more police officers. We need a community response that can be in partnership with NYPD. Uh, and so if you can talk a little bit about, about how you can join our efforts 
uh, to change the mind of the mayor uh, who believes something different. Um, it'd be great to kind of hear from you directly about, about that idea. Okay, so I guess the question is how can we encourage the administration to hire more the youths this summer to work in conjunction with the police department? And, and this plan that is, is kind of being stopped by all of you that says we, we don't have enough people power within the police department. Uh, and we said, okay, that's not, that's not the problem. We need, we need people power and that could come from the youth. Well, I don't know if, if necessarily um, as, as civilians, we can utilize those young people in intersections to direct traffic. Um, I, I don't know what the legal requirements are with regard to that. I mean, certainly our traffic agents, uh, some of whom are special patrolmen, they have the authorization uh, to do that. Uh, but, but I don't know where that, where that would lie with regard to these young people. We can certainly pass that message along uh, to the chain of command, but I, I can't make any commitment about that. As you know, we have our, um, our cadet program where we have uh, young people who are actually going to college, working for the department, to mm -hmm. have the internship program, which is a great program. But with what you're discussing right now, we would have to pass that up and uh, that would have to be worked at. Okay, I think that's it. I just want to make sure that you understood that. It'd be great for you to join in this effort. Uh, and I think our young people can be a part of it and really rethink how we utilize our neighborhoods and the youth that right now have no summer programming whatsoever. So help us save SYEP and get them to be a part of this plan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Richaga. So you used less than the five minutes and the intention was not to nominate by Manhattan, but it was more a speaker, Johnson, Kalina Rivera, they are the two corporate. And this is a transportation also committee hearing. So by we <coughs> everyone the fair share to make comments and ask any questions. Councilmember Koo, followed by Councilmember Cohen. Councilmember Koo, your time will begin when you start speaking. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Rodriguez. Thank you, Speaker. I also want to thank uh, uh, Commissioner uh, Chardenberg and Deputy Chief for uh, coming to this uh, online conference. Um, we all know COVID-19 is a nasty disease. You know, it affects people of every color, every age, and every gender. But there's a big difference of outcome uh, between those who are healthy and those with underlying disease, like the uh, hypertension, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, uh, uh, diabetics, and obesity. Actually, obesity is the underlying cause for all those diseases. So, but obesity is really easy to cure. It doesn't cost any money to cure. We just need space so that people can go out, do the jogging, walking, walking, dancing. No, that's why we, we introduced this bill uh, to have more open space on the streets so that people in minority neighborhoods, they have a chance to go outside, to walk, to ride their bicycle or to dance and I think we should also work with in, in, in coordination with the Department of Transportation. We also, also want to work with the Department of uh, Health and Mental Hygiene to have some programs uh, on open streets. Like they have the group dancing uh, or yogas on, in open space so people can watch and they, and they can participate. So if you go to Asian countries, they have a lot of citizens uh, 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 dancing everywhere in the parks, in the parcels. They call parcel dance. They one or two teachers have some music, and then uh, hundreds of people will follow them uh, on the plaza or in the past to to dance. So this is a, a concept that we, after the pandemic, we have to encourage and we have to educate people. They need to go out. Uh, don't stay in the apartment. Uh, uh, and to, in order to be healthy, you have to really like exercise and, and follow your diet. Uh, something we have to teach and educate and remind our citizens 
uh, all the time. So I want to ask uh, commissioners, uh, Trottenberg, maybe you can like, Thank you. be the coordinator uh, uh, for this program. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. And, and, and certainly, you know, I think Council Member Rivera and others have mentioned summer streets and other programs that DOT has done where we very much work with yoga groups and dance groups and fitness and parkour. And we certainly have a template for that. And, and look, we are we are very sympathetic to the fact that New Yorkers cooped up in their apartments are, are anxious for exercise. And I think that's a great suggestion. Let's make that one of the components we work through as, as we, uh, you know, as we come together on opening up some streets. Yeah, I, want, I, I forgot one point. I read a study that if you just do 30 minutes of walking a day, will cut down your chances of uh, having a heart attack by almost 50%. So walking is really, really important. Just walk slowly if you're a uh, senior citizen. If you are young, you can jog or you can run. A uh, half hour a day or more, and you will become fit. Then, when disease comes to attack you, uh, you will survive. Uh, so, this is a good uh, uh, learning lesson for all of us that before another uh, pandemic hit us, we all have to stay healthy, learn all the sanitation habits, like uh, wash your hands and, and keep a distance, all those things. We are, well, you. We have to be make it become our habits, not just like because we do it because of the virus. How we'll keep all those habits. These are good habits we we all can do every day. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Councilmember. Thank you. If now let's hear from Councilmember Cohen, followed by Councilmember Roth and Levin. Councilmember Cohen, your time will begin when you start speaking. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, first to my colleagues, it's always, uh, I'm happy to see everybody's face again. Uh, it's good to see you, Commissioner Trottenberg. Uh, I really think I have a question for the Chief, and, and I am uh, I wonder from a police strategy point of view, if we don't have sort of a, a situation analogous to prohibition, um, I think the compliance of social distancing is going uh, well in my district from, you know, from what I can see. But you and I both know that not everybody is compliant. And I, I think that the, one of the advantages offered by this piece of legislation is that people will be out in the open. If you see people and they're like, well, they're too close, we could tell them they're too close. Whereas if people who are gonna break the rules are doing so in the shadows or doing so you know, privately, I, you know, I've heard anecdotally about you know, people gathering in barbershops and doing things that, that really are, that no one knows what they're doing. So don't you think from an NYP perspective that you would have a better chance of being able to promote public health if it were at least not, if we were out in public? Yeah, I, I mean, I think there's certainly something to be said to that. I think that, again, that we're, we're looking forward to coming to a consensus with the council and DOT and arriving at a plan that accomplishes the goals that you're seeking to accomplish, which is to provide uh, public space for people to exercise social distancing, get fresh air, get outside in the sunshine, and to do it in a way which, once again, is not you know manpower intensive that won't put additional strain on our resources, but accomplishes those goals safely, Councilman. Uh, thank you very much, Chief. Will you uh, extend my regards to the men and women of the NYPD? I've been thinking about everybody, and I have not had the same interaction I normally do. So, uh, thank you for your service. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. And, and, and as, as Councilman McCoy said, we've been working with a, a men and women in women, NYPD. I know all council members uh, through all the persons, persons to be sure that we disseminate the message that physical distance is needed, should be respected. And as you say, it's not only in the barbershop, but we know that there's a lot of challenges in some schools, in some religion uh, building, that we need to send the message that no one should gather in, in one place that we need to practice physical distance. And we will be working with the men and women that want to be the enforcement a, a, a team of people who are doing a great job a, to be sure that not only everyone knows that there's consequences of even being fine if they, don't, if they gather in large numbers of people or in a large number. And so this is how it, I think that we will continue working you know, with you guys from the NYPD and anyone who is enforcing 
a, a, a physical business. Now let's hear from Council Member Rose, followed by Council Member Levin. Council Member Rose, your time will begin when you start speaking. Uh, Debbie, we can't hear you. You have to unmute yourself. I think, okay. go ahead. There you Thank go. You. Um, Thank you so much, uh, Chair Rodriguez. And I wanna thank NYPD and DOT for all of your efforts to keep us safe. Even though um, Commissioner Trottenberg, you know, it created some challenges for Staten Islanders. But um, I just wanna ask um, what criteria was used to identify and determine what streets were um, going to be open um, in the prior open streets program? Um, why was Staten Island eliminated and, um, and would you consider opening streets in our Densa communities, like our NYCHA, um, our NYCHA areas where um, social distancing is really a, a very difficult to achieve? Um, could you explain, you know, um, why we were eliminated, uh, excluded the first time around and, um, and if we can look at uh, other possibilities in terms of opening up streets sure. or closing streets. Closing. I, yeah, I, I I'll, can take a crack at that and then and then sure. turn it over to, to the chief. And, and thank you, Council Member Rose. Um, it, it is interesting now, it has become one of the largest parts of my job working on keeping the Staten Island Ferry running and, and keeping our crews there safe and the boats clean and social distancing and, and we know we've had to make some changes in the service and, and it's been an inconvenience, but, but thank you for working with us on that. It, it's, uh, you know, it's like a small microcosm of what the MTA is going through. Running big public transit systems during the, the coronavirus is, is a day-to-day -day, uh, day -day challenge. Um, you know, again, I think we're not, we're not going to say that the pilot project we, we rolled out a few weeks ago was perfect, and, and I think we certainly want to make sure we get to all five boroughs. We, we were admittedly trying to do something quickly. We were looking for streets that were wide enough that we didn't think there would be potential crowding and where we wouldn't necessarily have to tow a lot of vehicles at the time when we were telling people to stay home. We were trying to stay away from bus routes and, and major truck routes and major routes for emergency vehicles and you know then looking at areas that we saw were densely populated and I know PD was sort of looking at the staffing questions I, I think we we readily concede we can improve on that model and, and anything we do going forward we definitely want it to be all five boroughs I, I think when you talk about you know um, we were looking at the disparities um, in in New York City and we understand that um, Part, part of the problem is that people can't social, socially distance in, um, in our more denser neighborhoods, that um, this is the perfect opportunity to be able to uh, allow that and, um, and sort of equalize, you know, access to, to the rest of the communities. Understood. Thank you. Councilman Levin. Okay, Before Council Member Levin starts, if I could just remind everyone, if council members would like to ask a first uh, question, could you please use the raise hand function on Zoom? Thank you. And Council Member Levin, your clock will begin once you begin to speak. Thank you very much, um, Commissioner in Chief. Um, my question is, so we're gonna be approaching um, in, the coming, uh, in the coming weeks, um, uh, a lower rate of infection. We're all staying inside um, and practicing the social distancing now, and that's going to have an impact of by the end of May. Um, you know, a much lower rate of infection akin to um, other cities, um, other cities that we're talking about. So whether that's Oakland or um, uh, and other cities in the U.S., just we won't be at the same volume that we are now. But we are going to still have to um, have social distancing measures moving forward. So as we move into the next phase of this, it's um, um, you know, and, and it'll be a kind of a longer term um, containment phase um, where 
we hopefully will not have a high volume of cases, um, but we'll still have to do social distancing. Um, so I think that there's a, a, a strong argument to be made for kind of how we want to plan this out for a time when, you know, we're going to, more of all as a kind of longer term strategy of say, um, you know, 12 to 18 months um, of kind of what, what we, this is, there's going to be a prolonged period of social distancing um, uh, and, and how do we want to, how do we want to kind of operationalize this? So that, that's, that's my main question is how, how do we want to look at that? Not so much in the short term, but kind of this longer term vision for it. I mean, I, I, I can speak a bit on the transportation end, but, but obviously we're just one piece of, um, you know, what are some very uncharted waters? And we're, we're looking at a lot of other countries and cities where they're, they're, you know, they're trying to calibrate that, where they're opening up a little bit, and then in some cases seeing cases start to spike up again. Tragically, that is actually happening a little bit in California right now. Um, and we're, we're learning together on the transportation end. I think, as we've said, and the mayor, I think, talked about it actually in his, his press event this morning. I mean, New York City needs to function with a mass transit system that needs to be safe. We are also going to have to provide alternatives. And I, I think, as I said in my testimony, for DOT, the longer term, that's our focus, talking to the MTA and other regional transportation partners, talking to experts, talking to advocates, um, preparing for a next phase where, you know, right, we're trying to get our city back to normal and people working, but we still need to social distance um, and doing that safely. We're, we're doing a lot of thinking and planning on that. It extends beyond transportation to restaurants and, and workplaces and, and, you know, so many different elements of society. And, and clearly PD is, I think, going to continue to, to play a big role in, in the staff enforcement of that, at least in public spaces. Yeah. Um, you know, following up on Councilman's um, suggestions, I mean, I think that we we ought to look at um, uh, some of the some of the cities in Asia, uh, some of the countries in Asia, where um, you know they, whether it's um, in China or Hong Kong, um, South Korea, where Singapore, where they they have been doing. Um, uh, you know, where they, where obviously they've been dealing with this for uh, a couple months longer than we have, but have started to um, figure out ways to um, uh, have people out of the house doing exercise um, uh, in ways that that are responsible and 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 allow for people to practice social distancing. I think that that's that's uh, something that I, I think that I would I would. I think it's a smart idea to work with DOHMH um, along the lines of Councilor Ku's suggestions and look at what they're doing um, in places like Hong Kong. Totally agree. I mean, I think I think one thing we all know because it's it's in the papers every day, and I know some of you have been on the front. I mean, one challenge we've had compared to Asia, obviously the the Asian countries, is just the lack of testing and the lack of deep sort of epidemiological knowledge and contract contact tracing and the things we know in South Korea. China and other places they've had a better handle on. And I know the city and the state and the, the states obviously now started a program of, of, of random antibody testing. I think as we get sort of that deeper epidemiological profile, that is also going to just help us a lot in planning out the coming changes and, and how we reopen the city and, and right, try, try and create those recreational spaces and, and make sure we're keeping people healthy and active. Okay. Thanks so much, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. I think that we, we also have Councilmember Holden with time to ask questions. And Councilmember Holden, your clock will begin when you start to speak. Okay, thanks, Commissioner, and thanks, Chair Rodriguez. Um, I just want to, you know, um, I have some questions on the bill. Um, uh, it does require, the bill requires that DOT consult uh, with and notify affected council members and community boards and consult with uh, any business improvement districts or neighborhood associations, which uh, is right. Um, the only thing I would like in the bill is if the community board actually requested it or that a neighborhood association requested it rather than um, their 
just notifying us. So I know consultation, but I, I really want, if we request it, like the council member requested or the community board requested, and it's looked at that it's not just DOT saying we're, we have to close now since this bill went through, we have uh, to close 75 miles of streets and they might be putting it where it's not necessarily needed. Like in my, my district in Queens, not saying what will happen in the future, but we really don't have congestion on our sidewalks like Manhattan or some other areas of Brooklyn or other areas. So um, I would just like in the bill, and I don't know how you support this commissioner, but um, there could be other, other ways to do this. Like uh, I think you're doing, you're, you've mentioned something about extending sidewalks, uh, not closing the street, but extending sidewalks or doubling the sidewalk space with bollards or barriers. Uh, um, but what's your opinion on like sort of um, uh, like your input on this bill that it doesn't have to be 75 miles or it could be in areas that are requesting it? Well, I, I, I think council member, you're, you're hearing us say, we, we think that it would certainly be a struggle at least in the, in the very short term to get to 75 miles. And absolutely, we are very interested in a model where community boards, council members, bids, local neighborhood groups are, are interested partners. I, I agree, your district is, is certainly, I think not high on our list as a place where there's a lot of crowding and a big need to do this. So, I mean, I have no interest in, in I don't think anyone has an interest. We're, we're already feeling resource constrained. So I don't think we wanna go into any neighborhood that wouldn't want us. Uh, you know, I think the challenge is that there are some neighborhoods that really do and, and how do we serve them the best. But certainly I think we are very much envisioning a, a partnership model. We're gonna need partners here. But have you identified certain areas that you can extend the sidewalk or put bollards up? Have you identified uh, a number of uh, neighborhoods that that could happen? I mean, we have started. We have started to look at that list, and and I think, as you would expect, it it's in pretty dense parts of the city, uh, you know, where we're seeing big populations and and big commercial activity. It's it's not in the, you know, the less dense, more residential areas. But but have you identified like offhand? Could you mention one area that we're having some problems now with the I mean, sidewalks? You know, I think right now we're seeing, you know, occasionally sidewalk crowding in some commercial districts, as you mentioned, places in, in Manhattan and Brooklyn and Queens. It, it tends to actually be an issue, and I know the chief can talk about this, around parks and around like grocery stores. Um, you know, luckily people are still mostly staying home, so I don't think it's, it's a huge problem citywide, but I think we agree that as the weather turns warmer, um, we, we will start to see more of that and, and we want to get ahead of it, you know, working with you all. Certainly, I think out in your district, we're, we're not seeing that as a big issue that there's sidewalk crowding. Great. Thank, thanks, Commissioner. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner, before going to the public, I, first of all, just think about 51 council members and think about the numbers of council members that I say, I can work with you by DOT and what to do and give you five miles in my community that you know can fulfill the need to have more space. And Councilman Rose, you know, you were right when you say opening the street. So it's not closing the street. We don't want to close the street. We want to open the street for pedestrians and cycling. So I think that it, if we can agree, and I say coming from you guys, City Hall, with the speaker, the Lee, call Lee Klein of this bill and us and say, you know, we can get it done. And I think about, let's say, yes, Columbia, the New York private city hospital. I will assume that we can identify area in the surrounding area. I'm thinking about the Fort Tryon Park. And I feel that the same thing you will hear from probably some of the council member in the South Bronx in other area. So I would like for us just to be open no, it doesn't have to be the 20 miles straight in one avenue. It can be also depending on how, of course, in conversation with the staff or the speaker the, and all of us together, just to be open. And I think that there's so many, it's not only about, you know, opening some area close to Central Park or Park Avenue. Let's think outside the back, think about the outside community, the outside, the, the, the underserved community. But I have one question related to 
what have been your experience as a leader of the transportation committee of implementing these type of initiatives and bill in our streets without having a negative impact in our buses? And I say that because it, I had a conversation last night and some leadership of the, of the TW. And for me, one thing that I explained to them, I know that we are the council, our subcommittee in the city too, to expand our buses because that's the only mechanism, the most important mechanism that we have right now as a public mass transportation throughout the city of New York, especially in the third community. How can we, assuming that between City Hall and us, we can work the detail, implement this plan of opening more streets to pedestrian and cyclists at the same time that it doesn't have any, any negative impact in our buses. Well, um, and, and first of all, I just want to say you, you were mentioning the TWU and, you know, I, I just want to say that, that certainly our, our hearts go out to them and their members and, and they have suffered some tremendous losses and, and we're so sorry about that. I mean, I, actually, when Council Member Rose asked what were the criteria we used for that initial pilot, I'll admit one of the criteria was we said no bus routes. We just decided those weren't streets where we wanted to try and slow down vehicles now. I recognize if we're trying to do more mileage, we're working with the council members, we can take a look at that. But I think, you know, number one, those probably aren't good, necessarily good streets, uh, you know, good candidates to make as shared streets. You know, as, as you know, Mr. Chairman, we had before the coronavirus had come in, um, you know, some very ambitious targets to continue to build out bus routes. Our, our next focus was very much going to be up in the Bronx. Uh, working closely with New York City Transit as they did their borough-wide um, bus route redesign. I think, you know, as, as the pandemic lifts, those agencies will get back to that work. But that is certainly one of the things we will want to continue to balance as we transform our streets. I, I think we do want to continue to prioritize buses. I think that is going to be a mass transit mode that people are going to want to keep riding as we come out of the pandemic. Thank you. So with that, uh... And now we are I'm going back to the council of this committee and the team to then call for the other first panel. First of all, thank you. Uh, unless Speaker Johnson, Kalina Rivera, uh, Councilman Car uh, uh, Rivera has a question. Uh, we now, we thank you, the administration. Uh, and then we go to the public. But first, Speaker Johnson or Councilman Cabrera, do you have any final question? Since not, then thank you. A, a deputy chief and commissioner and the whole team for being here today. We are in this battle together. We will win this battle together. And, you know, we will continue being the strongest city that we have ever been. But please, as someone, the immigrant, you know, the guy living in the third community, whatever we do, have that in mind. Enough is enough. A lot of policy in our city, it doesn't matter who the major administration are, usually it start where they are more popular and usually it start and then we will follow through all the city, through all the community. So I, we would like to get partnership and friends of people who should understand that now is the time to put the underserved communities at the top of yours. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, thank you. No questions thank from you. me. Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you, Chief. I know that Borough President Brewer, I believe, is up next, and I do look forward to hearing from the public. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Okay, we will now turn, well, uh, just make a quick announcement, Chair. Uh, we will now turn to public testimony. Uh, I would like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Um, council members who have questions for a particular panelist should again use the raise hand function in Zoom. And I will call on you, or the chair will call on you after um, the panelist has completed their testimony. Uh, for panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin your, your testimony of, after setting the timer. Uh, please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. Uh, and if there are any audio issues, we will move on and then try and circle back to you. Um, first up, I would like to welcome uh, Manhattan Borough President uh, Gail Brewer to testify. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate okay, it. I, 
want to say I am Gail Brewer and the Manhattan Borough President, and I am strongly testifying in favor of the legislation introduced by Speaker Johnson and Council Member Rivera. And we've had a wonderful discussion to talk about pedestrians and cyclists and social distancing during this awful epidemic. And I thank everybody, uh, DOT and uh, NYPD and the good questions. I recently sent a letter with council members Johnson, Rivera, Chin and Powers to the mayor requesting that our city reinitiate its temporary pedestrian expansions. We focus in this case on Broadway between Times Square and Chinatown, but all uh, discussions and locations are certainly should be discussed. This particular letter and location had the support of the many business improvement districts along the Broadway corridor and has since picked up support from Manhattan Community Boards four and five, as well as the Financial District Neighborhood Association. And I think it's very telling and important that the business improvement districts are thinking about how to recover. And they believe, and it's not just this local ones, that recovery includes more open space for their businesses. My letter and the council's proposed legislation recognize the unfortunate fact that our streets are poorly designed to properly respond to this crisis. In many cases, particularly in lower Manhattan, the sidewalks are narrow, as we know, and that makes social distancing difficult. People may not return to work in entertainment venues and other locations if their experience involved enduring the pedestrian heavy crowding synonymous with Manhattan, which is, I think, was discussed earlier. It's really important that we create more space for pedestrians and cyclists, as you know. Traffic is down dramatically, although, as the NYPD said, lots of speeding. But with this traffic down dramatically, Time's up. I think we can achieve by closing some streets and motor vehicles. I'll be very quick. I just want to summarize. So other, other locations have ambitious plans. There are actually 135 cities around the country. We need to have uh, data. And I think that every effort should be made to garner this base of support. I just want to say as co-chair of East Midtown Rezoning and now a member of the governing group that's planning East Midtown open space. We have open space that we're planning. It worked with the bids. They had ideas about how to have access and they had ideas about how to do loading and reloading and that's what happened and that's why it worked so i am supportive i support the legislation it's really important need and it begins a conversation about recovery and future needs and i know you all have a copy of my testimony thank you very much thank you board president now we're going into the public and the clock will be in two minutes and now i will let uh, the council or this committee to call the names of the members of the public who will be testifying. Before we move on, do any council members have questions for uh, the borough president? Okay, next we'll be calling Mary Beth Kelly. And Mary, when you begin to speak, your clock will start. Uh, okay, can you hear me? Am I speaking? Yep, we do. Okay. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to testify on open streets. My name is Mary Beth Kelly and I'm a founding member of Families for Safe Streets. I always knew that if ever there was a major health crisis in New York City where I'd find my husband. Like so many physicians, despite the grave risks to themselves, he'd be on the front lines treating patients. Well, that's where he'd be if he had not been killed in 2006 by a reckless driver while he was riding his bicycle. As a physician, he felt honored by the opportunity to care for his fellow New Yorkers. I am happiest when I'm serving, he once told me, and I had no doubt. That's who he was as an internist, as a person, he lived his integrity. So why I ask is our city administration not doing the same when it comes to its citizens? Why is it being so stingy allocating space for our physical and mental health when giving space is what is required of us? Opening streets for pedestrians and cyclists reduces crashes, saves lives, and preserves our precious hospital beds for COVID-19 patients during this crisis. A huge opportunity presents itself now, and it begs for creative innovation. With our largest real estate assets, our streets. 
And please, Mr. Mayor, stop making open streets about policing. In 1976, when the city was on the verge of bankruptcy, I volunteered on a van called the Skatemobile. It brought skates to kids. Every day of that summer, communities all over the city, using only orange cones, blocked off their neighborhood streets from cars so kids with little else could skate. We had no police presence, only a local firefighter with a big red wrench who generously would unscrew. And uh... can I finish? Um, the ultimate sacrifice is now being asked of, of us. Um, but mostly our healthcare workers, grocers, delivery cyclists, postal workers, and transit operators. And so I employ our city government to serve them, to serve us all visibly where it matters. Give us space. Give us open streets to keep that necessary social distance. Space to safely travel to the bus or subway. Space that gives us clean air to breathe, gives our children room to safely ride a bike. Seniors peace of mind to venture outside and parents a little relief from being full on while keeping the peace inside. Let's hear the bird song of hope. As the weather warms, staying home will be so much harder for everyone, but especially those with the least amount of living space and without air conditioning. The streets belong to all of us, not just vehicles that most New Yorkers don't even own. Stop making us squeeze down narrow sidewalks, clinging to the edges to stay alive. Pass intro 1933, open streets, seize this opportunity and feel the deep joy my husband knew that is inherent in serving, of truly taking care of one another. Give us what is of greatest value right now, the very thing we need most. Give us space. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Do any council members have questions for this panelist? Seeing none, we'll move on to the next. Uh, we would like to now call Dahlia Goldenberg. And Dahlia, when you start speaking, your clock will start. Mick, can you come here? OK, hi. Um, my name is Dahlia Goldenberg, and I'm a member of Families for Safe Streets. And I'm here today with Sammy, two years old, my kid, um, to urge the city council, you wanna say hi? hi? Okay. And the mayor to open up the streets of New York City for people like us who really need them. Um, several years ago, you, you can, my husband got hit by a reckless driver while crossing the street in our neighborhood. His knee was badly damaged and he narrowly, you know, could, he narrowly could have died, um, but he survived and fully recovered. But ever since then, I've been more anxious about crossing the street because I know just how easy it is to get hit for real. Um, and so I'm overly vigilant about looking back over my shoulder anytime I'm crossing the street and the image of my child getting hit by a car flashes through my mind all the time. Um, so let me give you a snapshot of what it's like to be a mom with a kid like that in New York City right now. Um, he's very active and it's painful to know that he has less opportunities to run freely, to climb on things, or to learn how to ride his little balance bike. Um, our apartment is tiny and for the sanity of our family, I take him out once a day. And it's really hard to get him to wear a face mask, so he needs to be at least six feet, if not more, from other people. Um, if he's walking down the sidewalk with me and he's inspecting the trees or the rocks, or if he's riding his balance bike that he just learned to ride two days ago, um, I have to keep an eye out for anyone walking towards us or if anyone's coming up behind us. Um, and then I have to sort of assess whether it looks like they're gonna get into the street to give us space or not. And if it looks like they're not, then I have to pick him up, wrangle him off of his bike that he's so excited about, just as he's getting used to it, I scoop him up in my arms, grab the bike, run out into the street in between two cars to make extra space on the sidewalk for somebody to walk by, especially if they're not wearing a mask. Um, I'm, I'm in a side, just a little more. I'm in a side a na neighborhood right now. I'm very privileged to be in a neighborhood with generally wide sidewalks. Otherwise we wouldn't be doing this at all. Um, and when I'm out with him in the stroller, if people don't step aside for us, I have to carefully manipulate the stroller off the sidewalk, in between two cars, look for cars, go up, and then find another place to carefully get it back up onto the curb um, if I want to maintain six feet. Um, and having more safe space to 
so that I don't panic about him getting too close to someone or getting hit by a car would make the world of difference for us. Um, and I also have a friend who's an undocumented immigrant living with four small children and, a, and her husband in a tiny one bedroom apartment and they're not leaving their apartment at all. And they're in Thank a neighborhood you, worse than ours. Thank you. Thank you. Do any council members have questions for Dahlia? Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll next call on Nikia Whittington. And Nikita, when you start speaking, your clock will start. Go ahead, you may begin, Nikia Whittington. Go ahead, we can see you. Ms. Whittington, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Nakia Whittington, and I'm here today as a new member of Family for Safer Streets. I want to give my testimony for my son, Siobhan Bethia Jr. And I'm going to begin now. Next month will mark my two year and my son's two year anniversary since I buried my son. He was seven years old. His name is Siobhan Bethia Jr. He was killed by an MTA bus driver on Webster Avenue in the Bronx. His 11 year old brother, Deshaun, had to watch him die. All I wanted to do was lift up the blanket in the morgue, but they said not to because his body was badly, badly crushed. I kissed his beautiful face. I know we were living in a modest time of a pandemic, but the the traffic violence is a silent pandemic. Just a few months ago, Deshaun was hit by a van as he was crossing the street with his uncle and he had the lights to cross. He fractured his knee, he fractured his knee and his wrist, but thankfully he will recover. I am here today, but I wanted to speak out to talk about Siobhan and to urge you to pass this bill to save life, to help prevent others from suffering from both pandemic as we do. Siobhan was a special boy. One day I was out of a job and, I'm sorry guys. One day I was out of a job and nearly out of food. Siobhan took his books outside on a trolley and sold them. He made little drawings and he sold them. He got $70 and he said, now mom, now we can get something to eat mommy. If he was here now, he would be telling me, don't worry mommy, everything is gonna be okay. Our, our last Mother's Day together, he wrote me a poem and I wanted to share it with you guys. Sometimes you get discouraged because I'm so small and always leave my fingerprints on the furniture and walls. But every day I'm growing and I'll be, called, I'll be grown someday. And all these tiny handprints will surely fade away. So here's a little handprint, just so you can recall exactly how my fingers look when I was very small by Siobhan Bethia Jr. For Siobhan, for all of the parents who have buried their kids because of traffic violence and the COVID epidemic passed into 1933 and make it a safer, make it safer to walk our streets. This bill will make sure we don't spread the virus. It will prevent deadly crashes and will keep us safe. First of all, our prayer and no one as a father or two daughter, seven and 13, I know that it was, you know, you can express all word of solidarity, but you are the one that has the emptiness in your heart. And I know that as a person of faith, that's the only way, the only way of how we can wake up and go to sleep. You know, if something like that happened to any parent, 
So I know that your son now is fighting for you and for all of us. I just have a question, especially as a person of color that we are, which is my fight this day. And I know it is important to have, you know, the, our voices here in this conversation. How critical is this bill, especially in underserved community, such as in the Bronx, not Manhattan, in any world? So once again, I would love to thank you guys for giving me the opportunity to share my testimony about my son. He was very dear to my heart. And I would also like to thank you guys for the NYPD and the DOT for keeping us safe in this pandemic. Thank you. Do any other council members have questions or, or comments for this panelist? Okay, seeing none, uh, we will now call uh, Raul Rivera. All right, Raul, uh, your cause will start when you start to speak. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, due to uh, the, the short time of uh, a testimony, I'm going to read a partial of my uh, written testimony. Uh, Amy Cohen, Families for Safe Streets, will uh, submit the written uh, my written testimony. Uh, my name is Raul Rivera. I'm a TLC driver. I'm a TLC driver advocate, native New Yorker. I'm a crash survivor, and I'm also a family for Safe Streets member. Um, even with the COVID epidemic, I am not. I have not stopped working. Every day, I transport frontline and essential workers to and from their destination. I am testifying today because I fully support the bill to open streets for pedestrians and cyclists because it will keep all of us safe. It is crazy out there on the streets. <clears throat> I see more and more drivers speeding recklessly. In the Bronx, I have seen people stop traffic on the southbound lane of the Bruckner Boulevard, just so two cars can drag race down the street. Please, I call upon all of you, the mayor and the entire city council to tackle this speeding crisis now before more people are killed or seriously injured. This bill is a step in the right direction. It will make other streets less likely to turn into speedways. It will like it will it will let it will let our essential workers walk to and from work when they can without contaminating contaminating their neighbors. As a professional driver, I urge you to pass this bill. Thank you for your time. I kept it under two minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council members have questions for um, this panelist? If so, you remember to use your raise hand function on Zoom. Yeah, let's follow with the plan. So if any council member, I don't have any questions. Uh, I know Raul, thank you for the work that you're doing, not only on, on pedestrian issue, but also a voice for our drivers. Elio, I would say that unless council member raise the hand in the Zoom, so you just continue calling the name. Okay. Uh, next, we will hear from Mark O'Connor. Mark, your time will begin when you start speaking. Okay, can you hear me? We do. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mark O'Connor Diakwa. I am Deputy Director at Transportation Alternatives. And on behalf of the entire TA family, I want to express my sympathies for the losses of at DOT and NYPD and the challenges that our city workers and frontline workers are facing. We strongly support intro 1933. This bill is absolutely critical to slow the spread of the coronavirus and to facilitate our city's healthy and safe economic recovery. We just heard from families who have lost loved ones to traffic violence. And I want to stress that open streets save lives. When parts of Times Square and Herald Square <clears throat> were closed off, DOT's own studies showed a 40% reduction in pedestrian death and injuries and 63% reduction for motor vehicle occupants. And I was, want to stress also that this legislation still gives drivers unencumbered access to 99% of our city's streets. COVID-19 has revealed numerous existing inequities in our city and our streets and public space are no different. Um, many New York City neighborhoods lack open space not everyone has Central or Prospect Park in their backyards. 
and our limited street space belongs to New Yorkers. It belongs to people. Yet, despite the fact that most New Yorkers do not own a car, more than 75% of our city streets are dedicated to moving or parking cars with pedestrians and bicyclists pushed to the margins of the street. And we pay for these inequities with lives and limbs lost in traffic crashes and with increased risk of death from COVID-19 because of pollution from cars. Um, well, first and foremost, during this crisis, um, open streets are a public health measure and we need them to effectively fight this pandemic. We simply do not have enough street space to be safe. Time. And as the economy slowly reopens, we'll see an explosion in people who want to walk a bike and we need to be able to do so safely. Um, open outdoor space to maintain physical and mental health is a real need. Adequate social distancing is a real life-saving need. And this legislation will start to address these needs in an equitable manner without, with the urgency that this moment demands. And it's something that the mayor must not ignore. So thank you. And we strongly support this legislation and urge its quick passage and signage. Thank you. Do any council members have questions for this panelist? Okay, seeing none, uh, we will next call on Dr. Nicholas Gavin. Dr. Nicholas, your time will start when you begin speaking. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Dr. Nicholas Gavin. I'm an emergency physician working in Washington Heights and Inwood and assistant professor of emergency medicine at Columbia University. Today, I'm speaking for myself. Part of what I love about being in New York City and serving its people is the density. It's what makes great cities what they are. But our density, usually one of our greatest strengths, has made dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic significantly more challenging than it might be in places where people are more spread out. From my vantage point in the emergency department, it's become clear that our efforts to stay apart have been effective to slow the spread of the virus. It's also clear we're not yet out of the woods. I would know. As an emergency room doctor, I've witnessed firsthand the devastation this pandemic has caused when left unchecked. I've also seen how effective we can flatten the curve when armed with a plan. As the weather gets warmer and the days get longer, the urge and need to spread and need to spend time outdoors is going to be even stronger. Although public health experts warn against this temptation, it's unreasonable to expect eight and a half million New Yorkers to say to stay inside all summer long. Creating out outlets for getting outdoors for exercise and fresh air is critical to people's health. This is particularly important as you've suggested over and over again uh, in low income neighborhoods where families are often living in smaller quarters with multiple household members. We cannot rely on parks alone. There was already disparity there, um, particularly for working class and immigrant families in New York City. I've seen that social distancing is a privilege. In working class and immigrant communities, COVID-19 has run rampant. Access to open, safe spaces in these parts of our city should be a top priority. I thank Council Speaker Johnson and Council Member Carlina Rivera who announced this, this legislation. Time. From, a public, from a public health perspective, this is a no brainer. I call upon the mayor um, to support this legislation. Mr. Mayor, when you've looked to the future, you've been the greatest version of yourself as a leader. Think of UPK and the ferries. You looked down the field and you seized the opportunity. Open our streets, please. Thank you. Do any council members have questions for this panelist? We don't. And, and let, I say again, let's just continue calling the name. So unless council member raise a hand. So and just continue calling the names. Um, next, we will call on John Orcutt. John, your time will begin when you start speaking. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you to um, the council for introducing open streets legislation. Um, Bike New York supports intro 1933. And thanks especially to Speaker Johnson, uh, council member Rivera and chair Rodriguez uh, for their leadership in view of the mayor's intransigence on this issue. Um, you know, the speaker was absolutely right uh, in calling out the, uh, you know, the issue of car-free parks. We do do that with a sawhorse in the street. 
365 days a year now for both Central and Prospect Park. DOT itself has a great program called Weekend Walks, which allows um, neighborhoods to identify temporary pedestrian streets. And the way it works is basically PD drops off some sawhorses on the corner, say on a Friday night, and um, civic partners put those sawhorses out Saturday morning and, and you have a great weekend of uh, streets for people. And those are more crowded than we want today, but I think the model works and we should trust New York. And I know it's not the way city government has rolled in the past, but these are new times and it's a chance to make progress and try new things. So let's do that. Um, I don't need to repeat the case for open streets, which you all understand you've introduced this legislation because your leader's on the issue. Um, but instead I wanna, um, I want to sound the alarm on the city's unwillingness that the city's unwillingness to act on open streets now will really put us behind the eight ball when we start any kind of gradual reopening of our streets. You know, the most epic gridlock we've seen in New York City's history were um, the weeks after 9-11 and the days after Hurricane Sandy. It only takes, a, you know, loss of a few pieces of transportation infrastructure to really throw our system out of balance and to put a few more people in cars just doesn't work in the city, even if it's a small percentage. Um, Time. So we need a plan that has not only open streets, but pop-up sidewalks, pop-up bike lanes, more busways, um, you know, not abandoning congestion pricing. Um, there's more and more there, you know, um, uh, single occupancy vehicle restrictions. There's a wrinkle there because of social distancing. Gridlock Sam Schwartz has a good idea about that in a daily news op-ed today. So um, again, we support you completely. Thank you for your leadership. Um, let's insist on that plan because um, the good news is we may be starting to look at um, the curve going down and we need to act now, uh, not after this 2019 levels of traffic come back and certainly not 2019 plus. That's gonna make it almost impossible to fix our streets. Thank you. Okay, next we will hear from Greg Mihalovich. I'm up. Greg, your time will begin when you start your testimony. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, Speaker Johnson, Chair Rodriguez, and the members of the Council Committee on Transportation. My name is Greg Mihalovich, Community Advocacy Director for the American Heart Association. So AHA is obviously concerned about the public health crisis facing uh, New York City. Our you know, top priority is maintain, making sure people maintain their health and well-being today and going forward. And we continue our mission critical work uh, because we know that people with cardiovascular diseases are more likely to be seriously impacted by this virus. So uh, one way to maintain that uh, cardiovascular health is, you know, that 30 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic activity each five days a week. So we obviously know that that contributes. But staying active provides benefits beyond the physical. It helps manage stress and long-term activation of your body's stress response system, puts you at additional health, uh, health trouble, anxiety, headaches, depressions, you know, all these things that we know. So uh, even spending non-active time outdoors helps lower your stress and results in better health outcomes. So while these social distancing guidelines are in place, New Yorkers need to be able to walk, run and bike and roll in a way that keeps them appropriately distant from each other to maintain their physical and mental health now and going forward. Uh, and with the population density of our city, I think creating this temporary space is a reasonable way uh, to make sure that people can safely move around outside. Uh, we support uh, intro 1933. We thank Speaker Johnson, uh, Council Member Rivera, and uh, uh, Chair Rodriguez for the leadership in, on their issue. And additionally, while we understand that there are really tough budget decisions to be made as a result of this crisis, New York City should do what it can to avoid taking away funding from our active living transporta uh, transportation often when we need it the most. The Brooklyn uh, Greenway Initiative reported that Sunday, April 4th, their sensor along the Greenway the, near the Brooklyn Navy Yard had 4,000 bicycles, which is the most since they've started tracking it. Uh, not of all our greenways are well-maintained. There are gaps in poorly maintained sessions and why we absolutely need to pr uh, prioritize helping New Yorkers through this crisis and supporting and protecting our first responders and essential workers. We can't abandon our Time. active living infrastructure. Uh, thank you for everything you've done and everything you will do uh, to protect the lives of New Yorkers. And AHA remains your partner in ensuring the health and well-being of our city. Thank you. Okay, next we will hear from John Sanchez. John, your time will begin when you start your testimony.
Good morning, Chairman Rodriguez and members of the committee. My name is John Sanchez and I'm the District Manager of Bronx Community Board 6. I fully support intro 1933. It requires DOT to provide a plan for open and shared streets using the same criteria that's used for street closures approved by the city SAPO office. As district manager, I review several dozen street activity permits yearly and assist organizations with play street applications. This is one of the few areas where community boards have significant power and one we're uniquely familiar with. The guidelines for play streets and street activities require that safety be considered. The guidelines for play streets require that the street does not have high traffic, is not on a bus route, is not adjacent to a hospital, and does not have commercial establishments that would be curtailed or adversely affected. This legislation requires that DOT uses those same factors. Also, this is important to protect resident safety. Despite traffic being nearly 80% decreased since COVID has happened, we've seen an uptick in speeding. On a normal day, the Bronx would see 14 million miles driven by vehicles. This Monday, we saw 2.9 million miles driven. The removal of one traffic lane will not harm many drivers because drivers just aren't driving right now. More importantly, this is a time where everyone needs to have shared sacrifice. In Community Board 6, we've lost access to nearly nine acres of the available 29 acres of parkland in our community board due to the closure of playgrounds, which is about 30% of our total parkland. Intro 1933 requires that drivers share 75 miles, which is 1% of the 6,300 miles in New York City. Take it a step further, 800 blocks is 0.6% of the 120,000 blocks in our entire city. This is a sacrifice that drivers can take and all New Yorkers pay to maintain our roads, not just drivers, pedestrians and cyclists have just as much of a right to it as drivers. In closing, our community board is ready and willing to assist DOT to make this initiative go through successfully. Thank you. John, I have a question. Yes. Uh, since uh, you are the district manager, as I have said before, you know, representing like a mainly a uh, Latino uh, and black area. Yes. How critical, and as you know, this has been important for me my whole life, but as I, have, I, I always encourage my friend in the cyclist community, I need their voices. And I need for them also to understand that even buying expensive bike, of getting membership or the city biking order, it's a, it's a privilege. It's not something that many of the constituency that we have in community board, say that you are the district manager or the poorest neighborhood where we are dying by hundreds every day in this epidemic and that things didn't happen overnight. Also, we've been more affected because of people who never have access, you know, the same as other middle-class and upper-class community when it came to getting to bike. And it can to have, have also a space, safe street for them in, to buy in poverty. When we work in an area that is the poorest one in the whole nation, how important is this? Putting aside the other areas where we already know that there is a lot of bike, uh, bike lane where the, our middle upper class already, this is part of their life for decades already. How critical, how much support should the constituency in the, the uh, community board seek that you represent is when it comes only to say, we should plan, but also connect it with access for people to be able to have access to get a bike? 100%, especially when you consider that most of the essential workers, the e-bike delivery, the bike delivery people that utilize bikes and especially in the Bronx community board six, it's dangerous to ride a bike and make deliveries and we need the access. And we had a pilot program to have um, bikes in the, in the district and people were mainly using them to ride to the train station because in our district, we're about a 25 minute walk to the train. So it's critical in our area. And when bike lanes are used and when bike pilot programs happen, they're very popular in our district and we wanna expand them. Thank you. And those communities should be the top priority. When, if, if we work on this plan, that's what I call, you know, forget about my friend, the Upper West Side, the Upper East Side, or the middle class community in Brooklyn and Queens. Be a leader fighting to provide to the end of the community what we already have in the middle class and upper class community. Thank you, John. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Dale Corvino. Dale, your time will start when you begin speaking. Hello, everyone. 
Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Council Member uh, Rivera. Um, I am Dale Corvino. I live in Hell's Kitchen. I am the co-chair of uh, CB Forest Transportation Planning Committee. On April 15th, I chaired a publicly announced regularly scheduled meeting of our committee with this item on the agenda. The meeting was virtual, as, as, as such as we are today. Everyone who wished to address the meeting was recognized in an orderly manner, and the entire meeting was recorded. Support for open streets, both from committee members and the public in attendance, was unanimous. That is 100%. We later received the following minority opinions. Some of our neighbors had legitimate concerns about emergency vehicles, accessorized, and deliveries. And the plan we envision, which mirrors the, uh, the plan uh, that you'll vote on, uh, vehicles are nowhere restricted, and dispatchers can easily optimize travel routes in advance. Uh, one individual thought that the measure was unnecessary that since there are fewer pedestrians on, the, on our sidewalks. While this is true, it's also true that narrow sidewalks are too often obstructed by construction sheds, garbage, recycling, tree pits, meters, and other equipments that make keeping the recommended six foot distance while passing impossible without stepping into the street. In addition to the essential workers that we gather to applaud every night at 7 p.m., our district houses special workers, National Guards people, and healthcare personnel who are crossing town via side streets and groups. Another objection that we met was in the involvement of the NYPD. As other cities have demonstrated, and I saw cherry picking of data from Oakland, which is population around half a million, um, police presence is not required for open um, work. We envision a community-led approach. While of course the implementation will be coordinated with the P PD, the police department does not lead the city. The police department has their hands full with other matters. There were concerns that through traffic diverted to major crosstown streets would create a burden. Our analysts report that traffic loads are down between 50 and 60%. So traffic burdens are not a serious concern at this time. Our letter to Speaker Johnson supporting the open street plans with recommended cross streets is submitted as testimony. We expect that letter to be ratified at the full board meeting of CB4 in May. And we also support our neighboring CB5's call to fully pedestrianize Broadway. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll be hearing from Samira Beruz. Samira, your time will start when you begin speaking. Good afternoon, Chair Rodriguez and um, committee members. My name is Samira Beruz. I'm the Director of Programs for the Design Trust for Public Space. I'm here today to express our organization's support of Intro 1933 in regard to creating temporary space for pedestrians and cyclists on our city streets. Since 1995, the Design Trust has worked to unlock the potential of New York City's shared spaces throughout all five boroughs. We connect city agencies and community collaborators to advance change for the good of all New Yorkers and to evolve our public spaces with resiliency, equity, and mobility in mind. Mobility is not just about forms of transportation. However, it's also about how people move through the city and how public spaces, including streets and sidewalks, act as connective tissue throughout our vast metropolis. Now more than ever before, we can all recognize how valuable our limited public space is and how difficult it is to provide equitable and safe access to it during this pandemic. Opening streets for pedestrian and cyclists would allow more space for people to travel for essential services, take refuge from isolation and anxiety, and get the mental and physical health benefits of going outdoors, while still maintaining safe physical distancing to prevent the spread of the virus. We thank Speaker Johnson and Council Member Rivera for their leadership on this issue and urge the Transportation Committee to support this bill and to center its rollout in those communities most in need in order to best address the vast health and social disparities exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Lisa Orman. 
Lisa, your time will begin when you start your testimony. Lisa? Hello. Hi. Yeah. How you doing? Hi, I submitted my testimony online already. Thank you. I sent it to you, Elliot. Okay, thank you. I echo what everyone else has said. This is thank doable. You. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, next we will hear from Patrick McClellan. Patrick, your time will begin when you start what? your testimony. Is that okay? <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, my name is Patrick McClellan. I'm the State Policy Director at the New York League of Conservation Voters. Uh, I want to thank uh, Speaker Johnson, Chair Rodriguez, and uh, Councilmember Rivera for the opportunity to testify in support of this bill. Um, when New Yorkers leave their homes to get fresh air, which medical professionals recommend for both physical and mental health, they deserve to be able to do so as safely as possible. Um, but as others have pointed out, many of our city sidewalks are too narrow to accommodate pedestrian traffic while also allowing for proper social distancing. Uh, in addition, many New Yorkers are biking more often during this crisis, either for exercise or for many essential workers in order to avoid a public transit system that cannot guarantee reliable service or safe distance from other passengers um, due to the really horrific toll that this virus has taken on the MTA's workforce. Intro 1933 addresses these issues directly. And similar programs have already been enacted in other major cities around the world and have shown uh, promise in addressing issues of increased pedestrian and cyclist traffic without increasing conflict with automobiles. And of course, our city did not have enough open space or green space even before this pandemic. Um, for the most famously walkable city in America, our streets are too often not designed with pedestrians in mind. And when too much street space is given over to cars and when people choose to drive or take four higher vehicles because they don't feel safe using other modes of transportation, emissions of greenhouse gases and particulate matter pollution go up. Um, it's bad for New York's role in climate change and it's bad for a wide variety of public health outcomes, including respiratory illness. Uh, and tragically, we you know now that New Yorkers were exposed to the highest levels of air pollution, disproportionate in communities of color are particularly vulnerable to COVID-19. So intro 1933 is a temporary solution for a temporary crisis and NYLCD wholeheartedly endorses it. Uh, but I hope that this legislation's successful implementation will build momentum for full and partial pedestrianization of more streets, more pedestrian plazas and safer biking infrastructure, all of which can be built at, uh, at low cost during the city's budget crisis and made more permanent at a future date when the city's finances have recovered. Um, you know, whether residents are biking to work, walking to the grocery store, or exercising outdoors, they deserve our support and keeping themselves safe and healthy. And that will remain true even after this pandemic ends. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we will call on Eric McClure. And Eric, when you start to speak, I will start running the clock. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you, Speaker Johnson, Mr. Chair, Council Member Rivera, the other members. It's nice to see you all. Uh, Streets Pack emphatically supports intro 1933. Finding space, and finding enough space on a New York City sidewalk, which was merely an inconvenience less than two months ago, is now nearer to being a matter of life and death. Like many, we be believe it's ideal that New Yorkers stay home as much as possible in order to stop the spread, but essential workers have to get to jobs, people need to be able to buy groceries, and for their physical and mental well being, many folks need to be able to go for a walk or a run or just clear their heads, especially as temperatures rise. That's nearly impossible to do under current conditions. Well-publicized maps circulated in the past few days show that many of our neighborhoods are nearly devoid of sidewalks with wide enough for maintaining six feet of separation. At the same time with motor vehicle traffic having fallen by about 75% across the city, fast swaths of empty streets crisscross our communities. We can address that imbalance by extending sidewalks into curbside lanes on wider avenues, by allowing people to open their streets block party style to gain some breathing room, and by perhaps pedestrianizing traffic light corridors like Broadway and Manhattan. Mexico City, Berlin, Bogota, Montreal, Vancouver, Milan, Paris, Auckland, Denver, Minneapolis, Philadelphia, Louisville, and most notably in the US as we've discussed, Oakland, among many other cities have all opened or are in the process of opening streets to walking and biking. And they're largely doing it with little or no police enforcement. We close streets all the time for utility work or tree pruning or block parties with a few cones and a sign or two. Further, there's just no factual basis to believe that giving people some extra space will cause a rush of unsafe clustering. 
those who would ignore social distancing guidelines are going to do so on a narrow sidewalk or in the middle of the Great Lawn. For the 99% plus of New Yorkers terrified of catching coronavirus, we're going to self-enforce proactively. While we know that NYCOD, NYCOD DOT has been stretched and strained by COVID-19, we firmly believe that they should lead the effort to open Hi. some Many organizations stand ready to assist them, including numerous bids, and they, like we, believe much of this can be accomplished with minimal enforcement. Let's also make sure that we prioritize opening streets in those neighborhoods that have the least current access to green space and in communities where the parks are being most heavily used. Lastly, the effort to open New York City's streets to people now will help guide us as we begin the effort to shape the post-COVID future, one that tilts the balance back towards people-powered uses. That's a topic for another day, but we look forward to having that discussion with you all in the council. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Philip Leff. And Philip, your clock will start when you begin your testimony. Thank you. My name is Philip Leff, and I'm chair of Transportation Alternatives North Brooklyn Committee. Our neighborhood has some of the highest rates of air pollution in the city and some of the least amount of open space. Long before COVID-19, our rate of hospitalization and respiratory diseases was twice the city average. And we have historically borne the burden of highways and waste transfer stations that bring poisoned exhaust through our streets. We are more than an exit ramp though, our streets are our home. Our community is also in need of open space. Last summer, a few parks were overwhelmed on hot days. Playgrounds were teeming. The line to get into the McCarran Park pool stretched for more than a block. Now the latter two options have been taken away. It is unrealistic to expect people to stay inside for a whole summer. And in the case of stifling apartments without air conditioning, it could prove deadly. Opening streets to people will provide the space to get outside, stay safe, while staying close to home. While there may be more fewer cars on the road, those who are driving now are driving more recklessly. GOT and NYPD have the data to prove it. On April 6th on my corner, I witnessed two crashes on one day, one of which required an ambulance on one of the busiest days ever for 911. Why are we adding to the burden of our emergency services? Opening streets to people gives a signal to drivers that they slow down, stop using neighborhood streets as their personal speedway. Lastly, there is still a need for people to get to work, more so as restrictions are lifted. People may be wary of taking public transit, but even a, if even a small number of people switch from transit to driving, the increase in congestion, pollution, and crashes will make our city unlivable and send more people to our overburdened hospitals. Cities around the world understand this and are taking action to make cycling and walking safer in a post-lockdown world. I thank the City Council for continuing forward-thinking action with Intro 1993. I look forward to its swift approval and speedy implementation for open streets. Thank you. Thank you. Our next panelist will be Wendy Brower. And Wendy, your clock will start when you begin your testimony. Hi, um, I'm a designer and a 30 year resident of the Lower East Side. In 1993, I took part in a team rethinking mobility in Manhattan. Our 17 year plan reduced the societal cost of mobility by 50% by year 2010. Our plan opened a lane of parking on every street. Fast forward to today, there's evidence showing that particulate matter from cars exacerbates COVID-19 deaths, so that societal cost is rising. Distancing is a powerful preventative, yet too many heavily impacted neighborhoods don't have wide enough sidewalks as si uh, sidewalkwith.nyc shows. It's time to create distancing space by removing stored vehicles and reduce and enforce speed limits. Open streets will have a profound benefit on our health and well-being. Open streets is something that we can live with. Thank you very much to everybody involved here. Thank you. Our next panelist will be Graham Weinstein. And Graham, your clock will start when you begin your testimony. Okay. Thank, thank you both for the opportunity to speak. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me? Yes. Great. My name is Graham. I'm the co-founder and president of OutCycling, which is an LGBT cycling network of over 1,000 members. Most all live within the five boroughs of New York City. On behalf of myself and our members, we could not support this idea and this bill more strongly. 
I'm not going to make the case for open streets. Again, I think that's being made very, very well today on this call. I will say, as a community group, we stand ready to do anything we can to help implement a safe program for everyone, um, including the idea of creating a volunteer street marshaling program similar to what all large running and cycling events use as they use the city streets, additional eyes and ears on the streets to support the program to support something safely, if something like that were deemed beneficial. I want to say a big thank you to all the council members who are working on this and figuring this out. You have our full support. And with that, I think I will share my time. Thank you. Thank you. Our next panelist will be Charles Todd. And Charles, your clock will start when you begin your testimony. Hi, my name is Charles Todd and I'm a resident of Hell's Kitchen. During normal times, the sidewalks in my neighborhood are already absurdly cramped. There are many spots where a combination of a stoop and a tree bed or a trash pile will make pedestrian traffic literally single file. We are thankful for Corey Johnson's office working to remove outdated and unused payphones to free up some space, but the sidewalks remain too narrow. So while walking with the stroller in Hell's Kitchen is a challenge in normal times, keeping social distance while our sidewalks are closed during the pandemic is impossible. On every side street, we are still allocating two cars of traffic to the free storage personal vehicles for the minority of residents that own a car. If we aren't going to change our street parking system during this pandemic, then we must close the streets themselves. With traffic down considerably and the remaining cars speeding at record rates, it's time to allocate our street space more equitably for all New Yorkers. Cities around the world are closing down miles of streets to allow citizens to exercise and run essential errands without violating social distance rules. We aren't asking to have a block party. We're asking to be able to walk to the grocery store safely. New York should be leading on this issue, not falling behind. New York is not different from Oakland when it comes to the ability to close streets for the safety for all. We do not need the police to help us do this. We can do it ourselves. The only difference is the vision and the leadership from the top. If our mayor is being driven 12 miles to exercise in a park in a different borough, how can he understand what the rest of us are going through? Open the streets now. Thank you, council. Thank you. Our next uh, panelist will be Steve Schofield. And Steve, your clock will start when you begin your testimony. Thank you. Uh, I'm Steve Schofield. I'm a uh, resident of Astoria, a longtime cyclist, um, uh, street safety advocate, uh, retired general superintendent for New York City Transit. First of all, thank you for letting me speak. And we've all seen the maps about how uh, our sidewalks are too narrow all over to, to accommodate any kind of social distancing. Um, I also want to implore the city council and DOT as part of this proposal to consider um, opening the South Outer Rotary of the Queensboro Bridge to pedestrians. Um, even before this, the North Outer Roadway, nine to 11 feet wide, was already dangerously overcrowded. Um, even now, with the only essential workers traveling, it's still crowded. You cannot socially distance. Uh, at some point, um, when the city starts to open up again, it's going to get even more crowded. It's a lifeline for uh, essential workers, for um, hospital workers who live in Queens and go to hospitals in the, uh, the east side of Manhattan, and for delivery workers. A lot of the people who ride and walk over the bridge are delivery workers. There's no way they can social distance. And yes, um, we have the support of, a city, of a city councilmen and community boards on both sides of the bridge, nearly 3,000 people have signed a, uh, a petition and businesses in support of this. And yes, I know, I get it, DOT has a construction project on the upper level of the bridge that they say precludes this, but this really needs to be reconsidered um, in light of the situation. This is uh, not only a matter of convenience, this is a safety issue. Thank you. Thank you. Our next panelist will be Samir Lavingia. And Samir, your clock will start when you, when you begin your testimony. All right. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we do. Yeah. Perfect. 
Uh, thank you for having all of us here for some public comment. Uh, I just wanted to start by saying I strongly support the intro and I agree with almost what everyone else has said so far. Uh, I've been watching the mayor's uh, coronavirus speeches. And one of the things he said is that we need to have faith in New Yorkers. I, I personally agree with him. And I think we need to have faith that New Yorkers will do the right thing and they will socially distance when we open up this street space. I don't know where why people think that the majority of New Yorkers want to get sick, but everyone's doing the best they can to stay inside. And we need that space to just avoid cabin fever. I don't know many car owners in the city. There just aren't that many of them. But the ones I do know have told me that they've started taking joy rides in the city just because that's the only way they can get outside, but still socially distance themselves. I went outside and I measured the sidewalk right next to me. And as other people have said, between all the um, blockages, such as the trash and the, the sidewalk trees, they're just almost like two feet in width and it's just not possible to, to socially distance on. It's almost impossible to walk on in the first place. Uh, I live near the Hudson River Greenway and I, it's, it's an amazing linear park. And there, the problem is there are just so many people walking and running out there, running out there right now. Um, it would be a huge benefit to have some of that street space adjacent to it or in like in the nearby area opened up so people can run on the streets uh, safely. Um, the mayor and his, his administration have had months to act and uh, all we've seen was the, the few blocks that were opened up uh, a couple of weeks ago for not really that long. So I want to say thank you for the, to the council for uh, forcing this issue, even though I wish they didn't have to do so in the first place. Thank you. Thank you. Our next panelist will be Janet Liff. And Janet, your clock will start when you begin your testimony. Thank you. Um, hello, council members. Thank you for giving me a chance to speak. Uh, I'm a director of Neighborhood Empowerment Project at Open Plans, and we believe that our streets are definitely more than just conduits for traffic and they are where life happens. I'm here to testify in support of the bill uh, that will ensure that during this crisis and beyond, we, we use it to transform our streets now and in the future. Um, everyone here has really touched on a lot of the essential points. So just, just a few things. Um, you know, we have two time frames. we have now, and then we have and the not so distant future, which would be six to 18 months of, you know, an ongoing social distancing. In the immediate future, obviously, the, you know, the most more priority is safe routes for our essential workers to get to and from work and stay sane and safe. So that's, that's a, right now a high priority and creating sane and safe space for pedestrians. Uh, then a couple of things that people have mentioned that there are models and there are models everywhere and these models, um, as has been mentioned by several people, leverage volunteers intensively in Bogota, they do a lot of civic action, and we know that we have activists and volunteer groups and business improvement districts that are willing to actually manage these streets. Um, a few examples, another one that hasn't been mentioned are cones on construction sites that work very well. And I will say as someone who is walking every night for hours, that this is already happening organically. And I see people cycling, walking and cars in the middle of the streets and people are learning to navigate. What we want is really just a logical next step. Uh, I wanna reinforce what John said, we have to be prepared for the future and, uh, and to encourage people to reemerge and start our economy. Right feel safe on the sidewalk so we you know there we have to provide space otherwise we're you know we're, we're dead from the get-go and just the final point is that 75 miles is great but we need to recognize that that is kind of a start because we will we will need a lane on virtually every avenue and east-west connections in order to restart our city thank you Thank you. Next, we will hear from Jim Burke. And Jim, your clock will start when you begin your testimony. Hi, my name is Jim Burke. Uh, I'm calling you from Jackson Heights, walking distance from Elmhurst Hospital. Uh, many of my neighbors have already died uh, and we're still talking about giving us more space. This is ridiculous. On our sidewalks, you cannot walk down uh, and, and physically distance from anybody. There are no protected bike lanes anywhere in our neighborhood. We have one park and it's about a mile down the, uh, down the way. 
uh, I can't believe we're still discussing this. Uh, we cannot bike safely. We can't take our subways or buses safely. There's our buses and our subways are among the most crowded in the entire city. And, uh, and even though uh, that shouldn't be now because less people are using them, you have to wait 40 minutes, an hour to take the train. I don't understand how this can be up for debate. And I am so grateful to Carlina Rivera and to Council and to Corey Johnson and Idanis for bringing this up. We need help. We need space. Our neighbors walking down the sidewalk, you see the terror in your eyes as you're coming close to them. And what do you do? One of you has to step in the street. And by stepping in the street, you're putting yourself in danger. Because although there's very little traffic, you don't know when that car is going to come flying down. And by opening our streets, you're going to direct some of the traffic and condense it so that there'll be less speeding, right? There'll be more room to physically distance. Uh, there'll be uh, an alleviation of the crowds taking our buses and subways. I mean, it's a no brainer. And I, I, I can't believe that we have that, that we're, my partners from Bogota, and I mean, from Colombia and Bogota instituted this weeks ago. This is New York City. What are we waiting for? Uh, it's very, very upsetting uh, that we can't get this done and we should do it tomorrow. And I'm very grateful uh, to all of you uh, considering this, but please Time. get it done. Thank you. Our next panelist will be Cecil Brooks. And Cecil, your clock will begin when you begin your testimony. Hello, can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay, I'm a true Zoom user. <laughs> so hello, thank you to uh, committee chair Rodriguez, Speaker Johnson, sponsor Rivera, and all of the people in government offering le leadership. My name is Cecil Brooks Jr., lifelong South Bronx resident. I am also uh, a city employee working as, as a legislator and the Bronx Chair of Transportation Alternatives. Outside of that, I am a community board one resident in the Bronx. So I have a direct stake in how this land is managed, particularly from the equity standpoint and the cultural standpoint, uh, because I am part of the uh, often forgotten Central American, Hondureño, Afro, Indigenous, Latinx community. And we have a direct stake in how short-sighted policy has impacted the, lively, the livelihoods and the conditions that we are experiencing every day. Most importantly, I have the same boss as every council member here, the voters and taxpayer dollars. Something for accountability must be said when we cannot fulfill our duties because of a budget that is fallen victim to political immunity. New York City definitely has a unique history and has handled crises before which is why we should be able to figure out how to reroute 1% of our roads. Otherwise, every mile is not considered an important asset in the, in the lives of communities like mine that have long been forgotten. Intro 1933 for open streets was a priority before COVID-19, decades ago when poisonous urban planning displaced people like us into substandard housing and then destroyed that housing for concessions to suburban commuters. 1% of our roads should not make you lose the right to call this city the most innovative in the country. 1% of our roads should not force us to choose between going to a grocery store, visiting sick relatives, or going out to maintain physical activity. 1% of our roads should not make you think that you cannot do your job as a public servant. And it is something that I have faith that we see the value in. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Cecil. And, and one thing that, as I mentioned to John from Community Board 6, the district manager, and, and I also would like to follow up with you because after a DOT and, and LEAF, they were able to bring the city bike a, a weeks ago a, around the, Colum the New York Private Stadium Hospital. I also asked both DOT and LEAF to do the same thing, not to wait for the summer, to also bring city bike now, as last week, around Bronx, Lebanon, and Lincoln uh, Hospital. So more than happy, again, uh, uh, please send me your email as yrodriguez at council.nyc.gov. 
I want to follow up with you to see how we work together because I can say the Commissioner Trumbull, she was completely open. I said, we don't have to wait for the expansion of city bike, you know, as a timing uh, uh, for the summer, but because the urgency and follow with this plan, we already have the city bike around 168 and for Washington, but I also want to do the same thing right now around Lincoln Hospital and the Bronx Lebanon. So I want to follow up with you. Gracias, Palante. Gracias, hermano. Thank you. Our next panelist will be Billy Freeland. And Billy, your clock will start when you begin your testimony. Thank you, uh, Chair Rodriguez, and thank you, Speaker Johnson and Council Member Rivera. Uh, my name is Billy Freeland, and I'm a member of Community Board 8, which represents uh, Roosevelt Island and the east side of Manhattan from 59th Street to 96th Street. And I'm speaking in my individual capacity in support of intro 1933. Uh, I wanted to cover a couple uh, quick points uh, in my testimony today. The first may be a bit of news to the committee because it just happened recently, but uh, on Wednesday night this week, Community Board 8 passed a resolution 30 to 4 in favor calling on DOT to open up Park Avenue to pedestrians and cyclists. So this is yet another community board that is now calling on DOT to take action to make sure for public safety and public health reasons, we open up our streets. Uh, but I mainly wanted to focus my testimony today on the Queensboro Bridge. And I really took to heart what Chair Rodriguez was saying about needing to focus on many communities uh, and communities of color in particular. And one thing that desperately needs to be addressed is the congestion on the Queensboro Bridge, a bridge that many essential workers, delivery cyclists, hospital workers, in addition to uh, regular pedestrians and cyclists who just need exercise and some fresh air, we rely on the Queensboro Bridge. And right now, as uh, Mr. Schofield and others have pointed out, it is extremely congested. It is a 10 foot wide space on the North Outer Roadway. We ask pedestrians going both ways to fit in uh, a four foot wide space. We ask cyclists to fit in a six foot wide space. This violates ADA guidelines. This violates city street design guidelines. Uh, and it violates good common sense regarding social distancing. Uh, the community board in January passed a resolution 34 to four asking DOT to study a proposal to ameliorate these problems. Uh, there's an easy solution, opening the South Outer Roadway. Um, the bridge, like I said, serves many hospital workers. Um, and I apologize, I just need a, a few more seconds to finish this up. But, you know, for example, the busiest city bike station is 68th Street and 1st Avenue uh, near uh, Weill Cornell Medical Center. Uh, Chair Rodriguez, I, I just want to point out that DOT says they're rehabilitating the bridge or they're planning to rehabilitate the bridge. Um, my understanding is that those plans are likely on hold given the pandemic. So there's no reason that I can see that we can't temporarily ask that the South Outer Roadway be open to pedestrians to ensure that social distancing is possible. I hope you will ask DOT to consider this in any plan uh, they propose when implementing this bill. Thank you so much for your work. I greatly appreciate it. Really, more than happy to follow with you. Our next panelist will be Queen Lucy Woody. And Queen Lucy. Uh, Queen Lucy Woody, your clock will start when you begin your testimony. Ready? Yes. My name is Queen Lucy Woody. I'm an activist for the homeless. Um, the streets, the sidewalks are narrow. There is a, a problem with parking, but I'm against this bill because we're still not clear and it's not enough time for people to heal. My safe, I'm, I'm from the South Bronx at this present time and um, there is no safe distance in here. We have uh, drug dealers and everything on, on the corners. The, the derelicts and the homeless people have uh, basically taken over the trains. So how is there any safety as far as um, social distancing? I'm against this bill. The city's not ready. It's just my uh, opinion, me and some other people in the community. I'm from Community Board 9. I moved to the Bronx, and um, we don't oppose this. Thank you for letting me share. I'm done. Thank you. Uh, 
Council Member. I'm sorry, yes. I, which, which area uh, do, do you, uh, in which area do you live in the Bronx? On Grand Concourse, in 182nd. Okay. So, of Wall Avenue. Yeah, thank you. First of all, thank you for bringing the voice in. For me, as I say, I'm all about bringing the voices of the Black, Latino, and Asian in, in, mm -hmm. in, to this conversation because I know and I will, will continue listening for all the people, you know, who I are am Black, Asian. Latino. Yeah, all I say is about that I, I want to be sure that the voices of Caribbean, Latino, Asian are also here in this conversation. And for those who are not, in this case, for those who are not Black, Asian, or Latino, Caribbean, to please understand how fed up we are because we need to be sure that our community, as you know, where you where you live in the in the in the Bronx, in Washington Night, in the other places where people are dying. I, and I want to continue elaborating. One of the causes of why coronavirus is killing our people is because our people have not have access to green area, to to have safe street for Bike for cyclists uh, to to ride a bike with their children in the street. So for me, it is important again. Thank you for for bringing your experience, describing the reality that we live in the Bronx, because it's the same thing that we have seen in on the other communities. So thank you. You're welcome. Our next panelist will be Catherine Willis. Okay, I'll go ahead. Catherine, your time will begin when the clock starts. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Catherine Willis, and I want to thank Councilmember uh, Rivera and Speaker Johnson and Chair Rodriguez. Um, I'm very much in support of this legislation, um, and I'm a resident of bed in Brooklyn. And I think it's important, as so many people have noted, that um, we open streets and we really keep an eye towards equity because everyone's experience, even though we're all in lockdown, is very different. And I really just wanted to speak from my own experience, which is that, you know, my roommate and I are fortunate. We're both still healthy and employed. And, you know, even though we share a small apartment, we have adequate space to work and to even be apart from each other for our own activities. Um, but even on the street outside of where we live on Nostrand Avenue, um, the sidewalks are like narrower than 13 feet wide. They're only 13 feet wide if you count the curb, which no one should be walking on the curb. Um, and that of course doesn't take into account everything people have mentioned in terms of trash and tree pits, which I like the tree pits obviously, but um, social distancing isn't possible even in a broad street like ours. Um, and we're also lucky to be living less than two miles away from Prospect Park. So when I need to go out and run or get fresh air, I can do so, but um, that is certainly not an option for most people in Brooklyn, not to mention throughout New York City. So I think, you know, even before this crisis, it was apparent that we were giving far too much space to cars and trucks and motor vehicles on our streets. And we really need to be prioritizing pedestrians and cyclists and people who are most vulnerable during this crisis. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Our next panelist will be Nuala Odoardi Naranjo. Nuala, your time will begin when you start your testimony. Nuala, are you there? Okay, it seems like we're having audio issues, so we will move on and circle back if we're able to get her on. Um, our next panelist will be David Warren. David, your clock will start when you begin your testimony. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, 
My name is David Warren. I am in support of this legislation. Thank you, Councilwoman Re Rivera, for, Brit for uh, proposing this legislation. Um, I was speaking with uh, Christine Berte, who gave me some bullet points. She's from Czech Page, and she's a community activist and very well respected. And the Czech, the uh, bullet point she gave me was um, a sidewalk is typically um, a 14, 14 foot sidewalk on the side of the building with a three foot side curb with trees, garbage, parking meters, and other furniture take up a minimum of four feet. Assuming each person occupies two feet, this leaves only five feet of a walkway to cross each other. That's less than six feet. Most of the residential streets do not have 14 street sidewalks, but rather eight feet or less, taking up at least three feet. There are 3,700 blocks with active construction sites where there's pedestrian paths are prescribed by DOT is three feet. And on the 300 mile and 200 miles of sidewalks where there is scaffolding, there is barely space for people to cross each other in normal time. So we ought to keep that in perspective. Now, this is uh, what I would like to say. I'd like to say that hopefully we could uh, be like uh, Brussels with the priority zones. That would be, make a lot of sense. Um, I would hope that we'd be, we, when we ease back, we could do this uh, in a very graceful way. I mean, most of the civilized world has some form of um, uh, open streets, and it's a, and it's a disgrace that we do not. I would even like to, to propose a bold uh, proposal where, when we ease back, we can have a, a, a continuous bike protected bikes go from Brighton Beach to the Manhattan Bridge. So this way, essential workers and their and their associates can get to Manhattan without going on public transit, and they would have enough. Uh, space. Thank you all very much, and um, Time. thank you for this. And I hope you pass this bill unanimously. Thank you, uh, Nuala O'Doherty Naranjo. Do we have you now? Thank you for uh, coming back to me, um, Nuala. Your time will begin when you start your testimony. Great. My name's Nuala O'Doherty Naranjo. Um, I'm a resident here of Jackson Heights, Queens, and we were one of the places where the mayor did open up the street. He opened up a few blocks of 34th Street. Unfortunately, he opened it up as like an almost an armed encampment. There were police officers on every corner. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen the videos, but sometimes four people per intersection, four officers per intersection. And in reality, it wasn't necessary. What we need is space. We need space for children to run, for kids to ride bikes, for families to stroll, for essential workers to use their bikes safely to get to, to uh, work, for people to have space to walk to the drugstore or the supermarket. Um, here in Jackson Heights, we have one of the fewest spaces of park space. Um, the only park we have here is Traverse Park and almost half of Traverse Park is closed because it's considered a playground. So that means there's very little public space, leaving only sidewalks. And unfortunately, they're just too narrow, especially on trash days. L luckily, we have lots of great um, trees and tree surrounds, but it means that you can't pass each other on the, on the sidewalk. So what we really need is open space. And the simplest thing to do here in our neighborhood is to close 34th Avenue from the BQE all the way to the Grand Central. And this would leave a corridor right in the heart of a dense neighborhood for people to go out and enjoy some sunshine and fresh air after being cooped up in apartments for so, so long. What we're asking for is simple. Just close down the avenue where there are no businesses, right? It's an avenue that has a lot of churches and schools next to it. An avenue that has lots of uh, green spaces next to it. So it would be an enjoyable space. It's got a median down the middle and a bike lane. There's no, there are no buses on the avenue. And what that would do is give all this free space so for people, once it starts getting a little bit warmer, everyone's going to want to explode out of their apartments. Here in Jackson Heights, just blocks of um, Hospital, we need that space. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll call on Melody Bryant. Mm. Melody, Hi. your clock will start when you begin your testimony. Okay. My name is Melody Bryant. I'm assuming you can hear me. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for hearing my testimony today. I'd like to speak in favor of this bill. I'm a member of Families for Safe Streets, a resident of Chelsea, and, and open streets are a matter of life and death to me because as a senior, I'm especially vulnerable to the coronavirus. I abide by advisories to stay at home, but there are times when I need to go out. 
once every two weeks for groceries and an hour a day for exercise. I'd like to practice uh, safe social distancing, but my neighborhood doesn't permit it. The sidewalks on my street are about eight feet wide by the tree wells about three and if trash is on the street or someone is walking their dog and we have a lot of dogs here, not even that. So my choice is either risking infection from other pedestrians or walking into the street and risking getting hit by a car because drivers are speeding now. In addition, my neighborhood has a lot of street sheds. The other day, three men, ironically discussing the virus, walking close together and not wearing masks, came towards me as I was on the sidewalk halfway through a street shed. There was literally nowhere else for me to go to avoid them. Thanks to no space, they brushed by me. If I'd been able to safely take the street to begin with, I would never have been in this position. As it is, I'm hoping that within the next week, I will not be another corona statistic. This is especially infuriating knowing that 80% of our street space is given over to cars who for the most part aren't even using it. In my neighborhood, they're all parked. The pandemic has changed everything and we can't afford to wait on this. No one I know wants a COVID-19 block party, least of all seniors. We need to open up the streets to make social distancing possible for all New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next panelist will be Barbara Blair. Barbara, your time will begin. Uh, and you just, start to, your testimony. just to clarify with the Sergeant at Arms, I'm obviously not Barbara Blair. I'm Jonathan Hawkins speaking on her behalf, if that's okay. Is that okay? If that's fine with the chair, we can proceed. Could you repeat your name for the record, please? Jonathan Hawkins with the Garment District Alliance. You may go now. Thanks. Jonathan, you start, your time will start when you begin your testimony. Thank you. Um, we, we just want to support this bill, intro 1933. Thank you to Council Member Rivera, the other sponsoring council members. Um, I think that the council members and the other speakers have already done a great job of covering how important this is. Uh, the lack of space for people on our streets is a problem that we and other neighborhood groups have been trying to address for years, and clearly the need is even more critical now. Uh, so as you all work to continue to keep the city safe, we ask that you consider some further initiatives related to management of the streets as we continue to promote social distancing and eventually begin to allow non-essential businesses to reopen. So we are... Sounds like we might have lost him. I'm here, I'm here. Can you hear me? Oh, he's... Looks like he's yeah. still here. He's... Can you hear me now? Sorry, yes. I don't know if that was just me that got kicked out or everybody. I paused your time, Jonathan, so continue. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we're advocating for a few additional ideas. One is to allow restaurants, once they can reopen, to better distance customers while remaining financially viable by allowing temporary seating and parking spaces in front of their establishments, similar to the DOT street seat program, but modified to allow businesses to conduct transactions in the space. Next, we would like to allow and require that street vendors locate in an on-street parking space facing the sidewalk rather than narrowing the sidewalk space. We want to advocate for reforming the scaffolding policies, which constrict our sidewalks with nearly 350 miles of scaffolding that's unique globally, uh, accelerate the removal of unnecessary street furniture that takes up sidewalk space, such as phone booths, most of which don't even work. And finally, just prior to this crisis, uh, the Department of Sanitation had announced the Clean Curbs pilot program to get garbage bags off sidewalks. This program should be an even greater priority now, and we are ready and eager to partner with the city on it. So thank you all for your consideration. I think that uh, with forward thinking and a more proactive approach, we can not only recover from this, Time. but emerge with a city that's more livable and vibrant than ever. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, at this time, that is the end of the list that I have, but if we have missed anyone inadvertently who would like to testify, We'll give you a moment to raise your hand and zoom. Um, and if not, the chair can give his concluding remarks. Well, first of all, thank you, Pika Johnson, Council Member Kalina Ferreira, all my colleagues who participated in the hearing, the administration. Uh, thank you to the great team. Uh, uh, Elio, Tisa, everyone who has been behind. 
uh, on the ten, on technical on the technical part and the social media to be sure that New Yorkers can follow our hearing as we have said before. Yes, we are still dealing with the coronavirus. Yes, we feel for everyone who are in critical condition or someone that are dying as we do think holding this hearing, but as a city, we have to move on. As a city, we need to understand that we have to continue opening our streets, especially in areas that are needed the most. Thank you to all the stakeholders, transportation opportunity, the street block and anyone, everyone that they have lost a loved one in any crash, family for safe street, and especially those who living on the certain communities or those of you that uh, are the voices also with those individuals that have been left behind. Don't forget, look around when you ride your bike in the upper west side, in the upper east side, in any area, and as you will see, there's no much diversity. There's a lot of individuals from the underserved community that, that they use the bike to work. The deliver men and women who are providing a great service in this day. But when it comes to challenges that we have to bring diversity, to make a bicycle accessible, not everyone can, can buy a couple of thousand, a couple of hundred dollar bike. I think that we also have to, all those private sector, as I say, we will be discussing electrical school, electrical bike, and down to continue being a partner, to continue expanding bike. The street doesn't belong only to the New Yorkers who own vehicles, but also it belongs to everyone. But please, my brothers and sisters who are not, you know, Black, Latino, and Asian, those of you who are middle class and upper class, you know, let's do it together. Let's be sure that you put your voice, you use your leadership, you use the role that you can play in your institution especially in the private advocate uh, work together. Let's ride the bike to the underserved communities and we, you will see that a lot of the things that we're discussing right now should start there in community that we have left behind. So with that, thank you everyone. Thank you to the transportation staff, the council. And with that, this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>